Irina's frown deepens, her forehead huge and crenellated. I listen to the news, she says. If Guardian is dead or missing, new Guardian must be appointed for men. She's not dead, Irina. She's not even missing, she's just... Not here right now. She's gone away to do some important things. All right. She'll be back eventually, and she told me to look after this all while she's away. Irina turns her head from side to side to absorb this new information. Daryl can hear the gears and bones in her neck clicking. But how do you know what to do? She says, when Roxanne is away. She sends me messages. All right, Irina. She sends me little emails and text messages, and she's the one who's telling me to do all the things I'm doing. I have never done a thing without my sister's say-so, and when you do what I tell you, you're doing what she tells you. All right. Irina blinks. Yes, she says. I did not know. Messages is good. Good, then. So, is there anything else? Irina stares at him. Come on, girl, dredge it up. What's in the back of that massive head? Your father, she says. Yes, my father what? Your father he has left you a message. He wants to talk to you. Bernie's voice hums down the line from London. The sound of his disappointment makes Daryl's bowels turn to water, as it always has. You haven't found her. Nothing, Dad. Daryl keeps his voice low. The walls of his office at the factory are thin. She's probably crawled off into a hole to die, Dad. You heard the doc? When they get their skeins cut out, more than half of them die from the shock. And with the blood loss and she was in the middle of nowhere, it's been two months, Dad. She's dead. You don't have to say it like you're happy about it. She was my bloody daughter. What did Bernie think was going to happen? Did he think Roxy was going to come back home and run the bookies after they did that to her? Better bloody hope she's dead. Sorry, Dad. It's better this way, that's all. This is the way round things ought to be. That's why we did it. Not to hurt her. No, Dad. How's it bedding in, son? How are you feeling? It wakes him up every hour through the night, squirming and twitching. The drugs they've given him, along with the glitter, are making him grow his own controlling nerves for the skein. But it feels like a fucking viper inside his chest. It's good, Dad. The doc says I'm doing well. It's working. When are you going to be ready to use it? Nearly there, Dad. Another week or two. Good. This is just the start, boy chick. I know, Dad. Daryl smiles. I'll be deadly. Come along with you to a meeting. No one will expect me to be able to do nothing. Then pow! And if we can get it to work on you, this operation, think of who we couldn't sell it to. Chinese, Russians, anyone with a prison population, skein transplants. Everyone's going to be doing it. We'll make a killing, Dad. That we will. Jocelyn. Margot sent her to a psychotherapist because of the shock and trauma of the terrorist attack. She hasn't told the therapist that she didn't mean to kill that man. She hasn't said that he wasn't holding a gun. The therapist works out of an office paid for by North Star Industries, so it seems like it might not be safe. They talk in general terms. She told the therapist about Ryan. Jocelyn said, I wanted him to like me because I'm strong and in control. The therapist said, Maybe he liked you for different reasons? Jocelyn said, I don't want him to like me for different reasons. That just makes me think I'm disgusting. Why would he have to like me for different reasons than any other girl? Are you calling me weak? She didn't tell the therapist she's back in touch with Ryan now. He emailed her, 
from a new address, a burner, after that thing happened at the North Star camp. She said she didn't want to hear from him, couldn't talk to a terrorist. He said, What? I mean, what? It's taken him months to persuade her that it wasn't him on those bulletin boards. Jocelyn still doesn't know who she believes for sure, but she knows that her mother's got into the habit of lying so completely that she doesn't even know she's doing it. Joss felt something curdle inside her when she realized her mom might have deliberately lied to her. Ryan says, She hated that I love you just how you are. Joss says, I want you to love me in spite of my problem, not because of it. Ryan says, I just love you, though. All the pieces of you. Joss says, You like me because I'm weak. I hate that you think I'm weak. Ryan says, You're not weak. You're not. Not to anyone who knows you, not to anyone who cares. And what would it matter if you were? People are allowed to be weak. But that's the question, really. There are advertisements on hoardings now, with sassy young women showing off their long, curved arcs in front of cute, delighted boys. They're supposed to make you want to buy soda or sneakers or gum. They work. They sell product. They sell girls one other thing, quietly, on the side. Be strong, they say. That's how you get everything you want. The problem is, that feeling is everywhere now. If you want to find something different to it, you have to listen to some difficult people. Not everything they say seems right. Some of them sound mad. That man Tom Hobson, who used to be on the morning show, has his own website now. He's joined up with Urban Docs and Babe Truth and some of the others. Joss reads it on her cell phone when no one else is around. There are accounts on Tom Hobson's website of things happening in Bessapara that Joss can't really believe. Torture and experiments. Gangs of women on the loose in the north near the border, murdering and raping men at will. Here in the south, it's quiet, even with the growing border unrest. Jocelyn's met people in this country. They're mostly really nice. She's met men who agree that the laws are sensible for right now, while they're at war, and women who've invited her in for tea in their houses. But there are things she finds easy to believe, too. Tom writes about how in Bessapara, where she is right now, there are people doing experiments on boys like Ryan, cutting them to pieces to find out what's happened to them, feeding them big glops of that street drug called glitter. They say the drug's being shipped out of Bessapara, pretty near to where she is. Tom's got Google Maps of the location on the site. Tom says the real reason the U.S. Army is stationed where she is, in the south of Bessapara, is because they're protecting the supplies of glitter, keeping everything orderly, so Margot Cleary can arrange her shipments of glitter from organized crime syndicates to North Star, who sell it back to the U.S. Army at a marked-up price. For more than a year, the Army had been giving her a small regulation packet of a purple-white powder every three days, for her condition. One of the sites Ryan showed her said that the powder makes girls with skein abnormalities worse. It increases the highs and the lows. Your system becomes dependent on it. But now, she's okay. She'd say it was like a miracle, but it's not like anything. It was an actual miracle. She was there for it. She prays every night in the dark in her bunk, closing her eyes and whispering, Thank you, thank you, thank you. She's been healed. She's okay. She thinks to herself, if I was saved, there must be a reason. Joss goes to look at the unused packets stashed under her mattress and at the photos on Tom Hobson's site of the drugs he's talking about. She texts Ryan, secret phone, burner. He changes it every three weeks. Ryan says, do you really believe your mom's made a deal with a drugs cartel? Joss says, I don't believe that. If she had the opportunity, she wouldn't. It's Jocelyn's day off. She signs a jeep out from the base. She's just going for a country drive, meeting up with some friends. That okay? She's the daughter of a senator tipped to run for the big house at the next election, and a major stakeholder in North Star. 
of course it's okay. She consults the printouts of the maps from Tom Hobson's website. If he's right, one of the drug manufacturing centers in Besapara is only about 40 miles away. And there was that weird thing that happened a few weeks earlier. Some of the girls from the base chased an unmarked van through the forest. The driver shot at them. They lost it in the end and reported it as possible North Moldovan terrorist activity. But Joss knows what direction it was heading in. There's a lightness in her as she gets into the jeep. She's got a half-day furlough. The sun is shining. She'll drive down to where the place should be and see if she can see anything. She's feeling light-hearted. Her skein is humming strong and true as it always does now, and she feels good. Normal. It's an adventure. Worst comes to worst, she'll have had a nice drive. But she might be able to take some photos to put online herself. But it might come out much better than that. She might find something that would incriminate her mother. Something she could email Margot and say, If you don't back the fuck off and let me go and live my life, these are going straight to the Washington Post. Getting photographs like that, that wouldn't be a bad day at all. Tunde. It wasn't hard at first. He'd made friends enough to shelter him as he travelled first out through the city and satellite towns, and then towards the mountains. He knows Besapara and North Moldova. He'd travelled here, researching the story about Awadi Atif a lifetime ago. He feels curiously safe here. And a regime cannot in general turn overnight from one thing to another. Bureaucracies are slow. People take their time. The old man must be kept on to show the new women how the paper mill is soused down, or how the stock-taking check on the flour order is made. All over the country, there are men still running their factories, while the women mutter among themselves about the new laws and wonder when something will happen to enforce them. In his first weeks on the road, Tunde took photographs of the new ordinances, of the fights in the street, of the dead-eyed men imprisoned in their homes. His plan was to travel for a few weeks and simply record what he saw. It would be the last chapter of the book that's waiting for him, backed up on USB sticks and in filled notebooks in Nina's apartment in New York. He'd heard rumours that the most extreme events had been in the mountains. No one would say what they'd heard, not precisely. They talked grimly of backward country folk and of the darkness that had never quite receded there, not under any of a dozen different regimes and dictators. Peter, the waiter from Tatiana Moskalev's party, had said, They used to blind the girls. When the power first came, the men there, the warlords, blinded all the girls. That is what I heard. They put their eyes out with hot irons so they would still be the bosses. You see? And now? Peter shook his head. No, we don't go there. So Tunde had decided, for want of another goal, to walk towards the mountains. In the eighth week, it began to be bad. He arrived in a town by the edge of a great green-blue lake. He walked, hungry, through the streets on a Sunday morning, until he came to a bakery with open doors, a fug of steam and yeast leaking deliciously into the street. He proffered some coins to the man behind the counter and pointed at some puffy white rolls cooling on a wire rack. The man made the accustomed, hands open like a book gesture, to ask to see Tunde's papers. This had been happening more frequently. Tunde showed his passport and his news-gathering credentials. The man leafed through the passport, looking, Tunde knew, for the official stamp declaring his guardian, who would then have co-signed a pass for him to be out shopping today. He went through each page carefully. Having conscientiously examined it, he made the papers sign again, a little panic rising in his face. Tunde smiled and shrugged and tipped his head to one side. Come on, he said, though there was no indication the man spoke any English. It's just some little rules. These are all the papers I have, man. Until now, this had been enough. 
Usually someone would smile at this point at the absurd foreign journalist, or give a little lecture in broken English about how he must be properly certified next time, and Tunde would apologize and give his charming grin, and he would walk out of the store with his meal or supplies. This time, the man behind the counter shook his head miserably again. He pointed towards a sign on the wall in Russian. Tunde translated it with the help of his phrase book. It was roughly, $5,000 fine for anyone found to have helped a man without papers. Tunde shrugged and smiled and opened his palms to show them empty. He made a looking-around gesture, cocking his hand over his eyes and miming a scouting of the horizon. Who's here to see? I won't tell anyone. The man shook his head, clutched the counter, looked down at the backs of his hands. There, where his cuffs met his wrists, he was marked with long, whirled scars. Scars upon scars, older and newer, fern-like and coiled. Where his neck pulled away from the shirt were the marks too. He shook his head and stood and waited, looking down. Tunde grabbed his passport back from the counter and left. As he walked away, there were women standing in open doorways watching him go. Women and men who were willing to sell him food or fuel for his little camping stove became fewer and farther between. He started to develop a sense for those who might be friendly. Older men, sitting outside a house playing cards, they'd have something for him, might even find him a bed for the night. Young men tended to be too frightened. There was no point talking to women at all. Even meeting their eyes felt too dangerous. When he walked past a group of women on the road, laughing and joking and making arcs against the sky, Tunde said to himself, I'm not here. I'm nothing. Don't notice me. You can't see me. There's nothing here to see. They called to him first in Romanian, and then in English. He looked at the stones of the path. They shouted a few words after him, obscene and racist words, but let him go on. In his journal he wrote, For the first time today on the road, I was afraid. He ran his fingers over the ink as it dried. The truth was easier there than here. Halfway through the tenth week came a bright morning, the sun breaking through the clouds, dragonflies darting and hovering over the pasture meadow. Tunde made his little calculation again in his head. Enough energy bars in his pack to keep him going for a couple of weeks. Enough film in his backup camera, his phone and charger safe. He'd be in the mountains in a week. He'd record what he saw there for a week more, perhaps, and then he'd get the fuck out with this story. He was in this dream so securely that, at first, rounding the side of the hill, he did not see what the thing was tied to that post in the center of the road. It was a man, with long, dark hair hanging down over his face. He had been tied to the post by plastic cords at his wrists and ankles. His hands were pulled back, his shoulders strained, the wrists fastened behind him. His ankles were secured in front of him, the same cord run round the pole a dozen times. It had been hastily done by someone inexpert in ropes and knots. They had simply bound him tightly and left him there. There were the marks of pain across his body, livid and dark, blue and scarlet and black. Around his neck was a sign with a single word in Russian. Slut. He had been dead for two or three days. Tunde photographed the body with great care. There is something beautiful in cruelty, and something hateful in artful composition, and he wanted to express both these things. He took his time over it, and did not look around to scout his position or make sure he was not being observed from afar. Later, he couldn't believe he'd been so stupid. It was that evening that he first became aware that he was being followed. It was dusk, and though he had walked seven or eight miles on from the body, its lolling head, its dark tongue, was still in his mind. He walked in the dust at the side of the road through densely clustered trees. The moon was rising, a yellow clouded fingernail of light between the trees. 
He thought to himself from time to time, I could make camp here. Come on, take out the bedroll. But his feet kept walking, to put another mile, another mile, another mile between him and the curtain of hair falling over the rotting face. The night birds were calling. He looked out into the darkness of the wood, and there among the trees to his right, he saw a crackle of light. It was small, but unmistakable. No one would take that particular thin, white, momentary filament for anything else. There was a woman out there, and she had made an arc between her palms. Tunde inhaled sharply. It could be anything. Someone starting a fire. Lovers playing a game. Anything. His feet started to walk more quickly. And then he saw it again in front of him. A long, slow, deliberate crackle of light. Illuminating this time, a dim face. Long hair hanging down, the mouth, a crooked smile. She was looking at him. Even in the dim light, even far off, he could see that. Don't be afraid. The only way to defeat this is not to be afraid. But the animal part of himself was afraid. There is a part in each of us which holds fast to the old truth. Either you are the hunter or you are the prey. Learn which you are. Act accordingly. Your life depends upon it. She made her sparks fly up again in the blue-black darkness. She was closer than he'd thought. She made a noise, low, croaking laughter. He thought, oh God, she's mud. And this was the worst of all, that he might be stalked here for no purpose, that he could die here with no reason. A twig broke close by his right foot. He did not know if it was her or him. He ran, sobbing, gulping, with the focus of an animal. Behind him, when he chanced to glance, she was running too. The palms of her hand set the trees on fire, skittish flame along the dusty bark and into a few crisp leaves. He ran faster. If there was a thought in his head, it was, there will be safety somewhere. If I keep going, there must be. And as he came to the top of the rising curved hill path, he saw it, not even a mile away, a village with lit windows. He ran for the village. There, in the sodium lights, this terror would be bleached from his bones. He'd been thinking for a long time about how he'd end this. Since the third night, when his friends told him he had to leave, that the police were going door to door asking questions about any man who was not properly certified with an approved guardian. On that night, he'd said to himself, I can make this stop any time. He had his phone. All he had to do was charge it and send one email, maybe to his editor at CNN, and maybe copied to Nina. Tell them where he was. They would come and find him. He would be a hero, reporting undercover, rescued. He thought, now, now is the time. This is it. He ran into the village. Some of the downstairs windows were still lit. There was the sound of radio or television from some of them. It was only just after nine. For a moment he thought of banging on the door of saying, Please help! But the thought of the darkness that might be behind those lit windows kept him from asking. The night was filled with monsters now. On the side of a five-story apartment building, he saw a fire escape. He ran for it, began to climb. As he passed the third floor, he saw a dark room with three air conditioners piled on the floor. A storeroom, empty, unused. He tried the lip of the window with the tips of his fingers. It opened. He tumbled himself into the musty, quiet space. He pulled the window closed. He groped in the dark until he found what he was looking for. An electrical socket. He plugged his phone in. The little two-note sound of it starting up was like the sound of his own key in the lock of his front door back at home in Lagos. There. It's over now. The screen was bright. He pressed the warm light of it to his lips. Inhaled. In his mind, he was home already. And all the cars, and trains, and aeroplanes, and lines, and security that would be needed between here and there were imaginary and unimportant. He sent an email quickly, to Nina and to Temi, and to three different editors he'd worked with recently. 
He told them where he was, that he was safe, that he needed them to contact the embassy to get him out. While he waited for the reply, he looked at the news. More and more skirmishes, without anyone being willing to call this an outright war. The price of oil on the up again. And there was Nina's name, too, on an essay about what's happening here inside Besapara. He smiled. Nina had only ever been here for a long weekend press junket a few months ago. What would she have to say about this place? And then, as he read, he frowned. Something felt familiar about her words. He was interrupted by the comforting warm musical ping of an email arriving. It was from one of the editors. It said, I don't find this funny. Tunde Edo was my friend. If you've hacked this account, we will find you, you sick fuck. Another ping, another reply, not dissimilar to the first. Tunde felt panic rising in his chest. He said to himself, It'll be okay. There's been a misunderstanding. Something has happened. He looked up his own name in the paper. There was an obituary. His obituary? It was long and full of slightly backhanded praise for his work in bringing news to a younger generation. The precise phrases implied very subtly that he'd made current affairs appear simple and trivial. There were a couple of minor mistakes. They named five famous women he'd influenced. The piece called him well-loved. It named his parents, his sister. He died, they recorded, in Besapara. He had been, unfortunately, involved in a car crash which left his body a charred wreck, identifiable only by the name, on his suitcase. Tunde started to breathe more quickly. He'd left the suitcase in the hotel room. Someone had taken the suitcase. He flipped back to Nina's story about Besapara. It was an extract from a longer book that she'd be bringing out later in the year with a major international publishing house. The newspaper called the book an instant classic. It was a global assessment of the great change, based on reporting and interviews from around the world. The stand first compared the book to de Tocqueville, to Gibbon's Decline and Fall. It was his essay, his photographs, stills from his footage, his words and his ideas and his analysis. It was paragraphs from the book he'd left with Nina for safe keeping, along with parts of the journals he'd posted to her. Her name was on the photographs, and her name was on the writing. Tunde was mentioned nowhere. She had stolen it from him entirely. Tunde let out a noise he had not known was in him. A bellow from the back of his throat. The sound of grieving, deeper than sobs. And then there was a sound from the corridor outside. A call, then a shout. A woman's voice. He didn't know what she was shouting. To his exhausted, terrified brain, it sounded like, He is in here! Open this door! He grabbed his bag, scrambled to his feet, pushed open the window and ran up onto the low, flat roof. From the street, he heard calls. If they weren't looking for him before, they were looking at him now. Women in the street were pointing and shouting. He kept running. He would be all right. Across this roof, jump to the next. Across that roof, down the fire escape. It was only when he was into the forest again that he realized he'd left his phone still plugged in in that empty storeroom. When he remembered and knew he could not go back for it, he thought his despair would destroy him. He climbed a tree, lashed himself to a branch, and tried to sleep, thinking things might look better in the morning. That night, he thought he saw a ceremony in the woods. He thought that, from his high perch in the tree. He was awakened by the sound of crackling flame and felt a momentary terror that the women had set the trees on fire again, that he would burn alive up here. He opened his eyes. The fire was not near at hand, but a little way off, glimmering in a forest clearing. Around the fire... There were figures dancing, men and women stripped naked and painted with the symbol of the eye in the center of an outstretched palm, the lines of power 
emanating sinuously around their bodies. At times, one of the women would push a man to the ground with a blue bright jolt, placing her hand on the painted symbol on his chest, both of them whooping and crying out as she showed her power on him. She would mount him then, her hand still in the center of him, still holding him down, the frenzy of it showing on his face, urging her to hurt him again, harder, more. It had been months since Tunde had held a woman, or been held by one. He began to yearn to climb down from his perch, to walk into the center of the rock circle, to allow himself to be used as those men were used. He grew hard watching. He rubbed himself absently through the fabric of his jeans. There was the sound of a great drumming. Can there have been drums? Would it not have attracted attention? It must have been a dream. Four young men crawled on all fours in front of a woman in a scarlet robe. Her eye sockets were empty, red and raw. There was a grandeur to her step, a certainty in her blindness. The other women prostrated themselves, kneeling and full body before her. She began to speak, and they to respond. As in a dream, he understood their words, although his Romanian was not good, and it was impossible they were speaking English. And yet, he understood. She said, Is one prepared? They said, Yes. She said, Bring him forward. A young man walked into the center of the circle. He wore a crown of branches in his hair and a white cloth tied at his waist. His face was peaceful. He was the willing sacrifice that would atone for all the others. She said, You are weak, and we are strong. You are the gift, and we are the owners. You are the victim. And we are the victors. You are the slave. And we are the masters. You are the sacrifice. And we are the recipients. You are the son. And we are the mother. Do you acknowledge that it is so? All the men in the circle looked on eagerly. Yes, they whispered. Yes, yes. Please, yes, now, yes. And Tunde found himself muttering it with them. Yes. The young man held out his wrists to the blind woman, and she found them with one sure motion, gripping one in each hand. Tunde knew what was about to happen. Holding his camera, he could barely make the finger on the shutter release press down. He wanted to see it happen. The blind woman at the fire was all the women who had nearly killed him, who could have killed him. She was Enuma, and she was Nina, and she was the woman on the rooftop in Delhi, and she was his sister Temi, and she was Noor, and she was Tatiana Moskalev, and she was the pregnant woman in the wreckage of the Arizona Mall. The possibility had been pressing in on him all of these years, pushing down on his body, and he wanted it done now, wanted to see it done. In that moment, he longed to be the one with his wrists clasped. He longed to kneel at her feet, his face buried in the wet soil. He wanted the fight over. He wanted to know who won, even at his own cost. He wanted the final scene. She held the young man's wrists. She pressed her forehead to his. Yes, he whispered, yes. And when she killed him, it was ecstasy. In the morning, Tunde still does not know whether it was a dream. His manual camera is advanced by 18 pictures. He might have pressed the button in his sleep. He will only know if the film is developed. He hopes it was a dream, but that has its own terrors. If in some dream place, he had yearned to kneel. He sits in the tree and thinks things through from the night before. It does look better in the morning somehow, or at least less terrifying. The report of his death can't have been an accident or a coincidence.
It's too much. Moskalev or her people must have discovered that he'd gone, that his passport had gone with him. The whole thing must have been staged. The car accident, the charred body, the suitcase. This means one very important thing. He cannot go to the police. There is no more fantasy. He had not quite realized before that this fantasy still clung to the edges of his mind, that he can walk into a police station with his hands up and say, Sorry, cheeky Nigerian journalist here. I've made some mistakes. Take me home. They won't take him home. They will take him out into a quiet place in the woods and shoot him. He is alone. He needs to find an internet connection. There will be one somewhere. A friendly man who'll let him use the home computer for just a few minutes. He can convince them in five lines that it's him, that he's really alive. He's shaking as he climbs down from the tree. He'll walk on from here. He'll stay in the forest and head for a village he passed through four days ago with some friendly faces. He'll send his messages. They'll come for him. He shifts his bag on his back and sets his face to the south. There's a noise in the bushes to his right. He whirls around, but the noise is on the left too, and behind him. There are women standing up in the bushes, and he knows then with a terror like a springing trap. They've been waiting for him, waiting all night to catch him. He tries to break into a run, but there's something at his ankles, a wire, and he falls. Down, down, struggling, and someone laughs, and someone jolts him on the back of the neck. When he wakes, he is in a cage, and something is very bad. The cage is small and made of wood. His backpack is in here with him. His knees are pulled up to his chest. There is no room to stretch them out. He can feel from the throbbing ache in his muscles that he's been like this for hours. He's in a woodland camp. There is a small campfire burning. He knows this place. It is the camp he saw in the dream. Not dream. It is the encampment of the blind woman, and they have caught him. His whole body starts to shake. It can't end here, not trapped like this, not thrown on the fire or executed for some god-awful tree-magic religion. He rattles the sides of the cage with his legs. Please, he shouts, though no one is listening. Please, someone, help me. There's a low, throaty chuckle from the other side of him. He cranes his head to look. There's a woman standing there. Got yourself in a fucking mess, haven't you? She says. He tries to make his eyes focus. He knows the voice from somewhere, a long way away, a long time ago. As if the voice were famous. He blinks, and she comes into view. It's Roxanne Monk. Roxy. She says. I recognize your face as soon as I saw you. Seen you on the telly, haven't I? He thinks he's in a dream. Must be. Can't not be. He starts to cry, like a child confused and angry. She says, stop that now. You'll set me off. What the fuck are you doing here anyway? He tries to tell her, but the story no longer makes sense even to him. He decided to walk into danger because he thought he was enough. And now he is in danger, and it is clear to him that he has never been enough, and it is unbearable. I was looking for her in the mountain cult, he barks out at last. His throat is dry, and his head aches. She laughs. Yeah, well, you found it. So that was a bloody stupid idea, wasn't it? She gestures around her. He's at the edge of a small encampment. There are perhaps forty dirty tents and huts slumped around the central fire. A few women are at the open mouths of their huts, wetting knives or fixing metal shot gauntlets or staring blankly. The place stinks. A smell of burning flesh and rotten food and feces and dogs and a sour note of vomit. To one side of the latrine, there's a pile of bones. Tunde hopes they are animal bones. There are two sad-looking dogs, 
tied by short lengths of rope to a tree. One has an eye missing and patches of fur. He says, You have to help me. Please, please help me. She looks at him, and her face twists into an awkward half-smile. She shrugs, and he sees that she's drunk. Fuck. I don't know what I can do, mate. I don't have much influence here. Fuck. He's going to have to be more charming than he's ever been in his whole life. And he's stuck in a cage where he can't even move his neck. He takes a deep breath. He can do it. He can. What are you doing here? You vanished the night of the big Moskalev party. And that was months ago. Even when I left the city, they were saying you'd been bumped off. Roxy laughs. Were they now? Were they? Well, someone tried, and it's taken me a while to heal is all. You look pretty uh, healed now. He looks her up and down appreciatively. He's particularly impressed with himself for doing so without being able to move. She laughs. I was going to be president of this fucking country, you know, for about... Three hours there, I was going to be the fucking president. Yeah, he says. I was going to be the star of Amazon's fall lineup. He looks right and left. Think they're coming for me now with a drone? And then she's laughing. And he's laughing too. The women at the entrances to the tents glance over at them balefully. Seriously, what are they going to do with me? He says. Ah, these people are bloody mental. They hunt men at night, says Roxy. Send girls off into the forest to scare them. Once they're scared and running, they set a trap. Tripwire, something like that. They haunted me. Well, you bloody walked towards them, didn't you? Roxy makes another little half-smile. They got some thing about blokes. They round up boys and let them be king for a few weeks, then stick antlers on their heads and kill them at new moon. Or a full moon or... One of those moons, obsessed by the fucking moon. If you ask me, it's because they got no telly. He laughs again. A real laugh. She's funny. This is the magic by daylight. Tricks and cruelty. The magic is in the belief in magic. All this is, is people with an insane idea. The only horror in it is imagining oneself into their minds and that their insanity might have some consequences on the body. Listen, he says, now we're here. How hard would it be for you to get me out? He gives the door of his cage a little push with his feet. It is bound fast by several twine cords. It would not be hard for Roxy to cut them if she had a knife, but the people around the encampment would see. She pulls a flask out of her back pocket and takes a little swig. Shakes her head. They know me, she says, but I don't bother them. They don't bother me. So, you've been hiding in the wood for weeks, not bothering them? Yeah, she says. A fragment of something he read a long time ago floats through his mind. A flattering looking glass. He has to be a flattering mirror for her, reflecting her at twice her ordinary size, making her seem to herself to be strong enough to do this thing he needs her to do. Without that power, mutters a voice in his head, probably the earth would still be swamp and jungle. That's not you, he says. That's not who you are. I'm not who I was, my friend. You can't stop being who you are. You're Roxy Monk. She snorts. You want me to fight our way out of here? Because <laughs> that's not going to happen. He gives a little laugh, like she's trying it on. Must be making a joke. You don't need to fight. You're Roxy Monk. You've got power to burn. I've seen you. I've heard about you. I've always wanted to meet you. You're the strongest woman anyone's ever seen. I've read the reports. You killed your father's rival in London and then put him out to pasture himself. You can just ask them for me, and they'll open the door. She shakes her head. You've got to have something to offer, something to trade. But she's thinking it through now. 
He can see it. What have you got that they want? He says. Her fingers dig into the wet earth. She holds two handfuls of soil for a moment, looking at him. I told myself, I'd keep my head down. She says. He says, but that's not you. I've read about you. He hesitates, then chances his luck. I think you'll help me, because it's nothing to you to do it. Please, because you're a Roxy monk. She swallows. She says, yeah. Yeah, I am. At dusk, more of the women return to the camp, and Roxanne Monk bargains with the blind woman for Tunde's life. As she speaks, Tunde sees that he was right. The people in this camp seem respectful and a little frightened of her. She has a small plastic bag of drugs that she dangles in front of the leaders of the camp. She asks for something, but is turned down. She shrugs. She gestures her head towards him. Fine, she seems to be saying. If we can't make a deal this way, I'll take that boy instead. The women are surprised, then suspicious. Really? That one? It's not a trick. There is a little haggling. The blind woman tries to argue. Roxy argues back. In the end, it doesn't take too much to persuade them to let him go. He was right about how they see Roxy, and he is not particularly prized. If this woman wants him, let her take him. The soldiers are coming anyway. The war is closer every day. These people are not mad enough to want to stay here now that the soldiers are close by. They'll take up their encampment in two or three days and move towards the mountains. They bind his arms tightly behind his back. They throw in the bag he was carrying for nothing, just to show her some respect. Don't be too friendly with me, she says as she pushes him to walk ahead of her. I want them to think I like you or that I got you cheap. His legs are cramped from his time in the cage. He has to take slow, shuffling steps along the forest path. It is an age until they are out of sight of the camp, and another eon until they cannot hear the noise of it behind them. With each step, he thinks, I am tied, and I am in the hands of Roxanne Monk. He thinks, she's a dangerous woman at the best of times. What if she's just playing with me? Once these thoughts have flashed across the mind, they can never be put back. He is silent, until a few miles along the dirt track, she says, I think that's far enough, and takes a small knife from her pocket and cuts his bonds. He says, what are you going to do with me? She says, I suppose I'll rescue you. Get you home. I'm Roxy Monk, after all. Then she breaks into a laugh. Anyway, you're a celebrity. People would pay good money for this, wouldn't they? Walk through the forest with a celeb. And this makes him laugh. And his laughter makes her laugh. And then they are both standing in the forest, leaning against a tree, hooting and gasping for breath. And something is broken between them then. And something is a little easier. Where are we heading? He says. She shrugs. I've been lying low for a bit. Something's rotten with my people. Someone betrayed me. I'm all right if they think I'm dead. Till I can work out how to get back what's mine. You've been hiding, he says, in a war zone? Isn't that a bloody stupid idea? She looks at him sharply. He's chancing something here. He can already feel the prickles across his shoulder where she'd jolt him if he pissed her off. He might be a celebrity, but she's a mugshot. She kicks at the stone leaf mix on the path and says, Yeah, probably. I didn't have much option, though. No nice compound in South America to jet off to. I thought you people had it all worked out. He does have to know how angry he can make her. This is clear right through to his bones. If she's going to try to hurt him, he needs to know that first. He's tensed for the blow already, but it does not come. She sticks her hands in her pockets. 
I'm all right here, she says. People keep their mouths shut. I'd left stuff for myself just in case, you know. He thinks of the little plastic packet she held in front of the women in the camp. Yes. If you're using an unstable regime to smuggle drugs, you probably do have any number of secret supply dumps, just in case of trouble. Here, she says. You're not going to write about this, are you? Depends whether I get out alive, he says. And that makes her laugh. And then he's laughing again. And after a minute, she says, It's my brother, Daryl. He's got something of mine, and I'm going to have to be careful how I get it back off him. I'll get you home, but until I work out what to do, we're lying low. Okay. And that means we're going to spend a few nights in a refugee camp. They come to a tented muddy field at the bottom of a gully. Roxy goes to claim a space for them. Just a few days, she says. Make yourself useful. Meet people. Get to know them. Ask what they want. At the bottom of his rucksack, he finds an ID card from an Italian news-gathering service, a year out of date, but enough to encourage some people to talk. He uses it judiciously, wandering from tent to tent. He learns that there has been more fighting than he'd heard, and more recently, that in the past three weeks, the helicopters don't even land anymore. They drop food and medicine and clothes and more tents for the slow and steady stream of stumbling people arriving through the woods. UNESCO is, understandably, unwilling to risk its people here. Roxy is treated respectfully here. She is a person who knows how to get certain drugs and fuel. She helps people with the things they need, and because he's with her, because he sleeps on a metal bed in her tent, the people here leave him alone. He feels a little safe, for the first time in weeks. But of course, he is not safe. Unlike Roxy, he could not simply walk into the forest in this place. Even if no other forest cult caught him, he is illegal now. He interviews a few English-speaking people in the camp who tell him the same thing over and over again. They are rounding up the men without papers. They go away for work detail, but they do not return. Some of the men here and some of the women tell the same story. There have been editorials in the newspapers and thoughtful to camera pieces on the one working black and white TV in the hospital tent. The subject is, how many men do we really need? Think it over, they say. Men are dangerous. Men commit the great majority of crimes. Men are less intelligent, less diligent, less hard-working. Their brains are in their muscles and their pricks. Men are more likely to suffer from diseases, and they are a drain on the resources of the country. Of course we need them to have babies, but how many do we need for that? Not as many as women. Good, clean, obedient men, of course there will always be a place for those, but how many is that? Maybe one in ten? You can't be serious, Kristen. Is that really what they're saying? I'm afraid it is, Matt. She puts a gentle hand on his knee. And of course, they're not talking about great guys like you. But that is the message of some extremist websites. That's why the North Star girls need more authority. We've got to protect ourselves against these people. Matt nods, his face somber. I blame those men's rights people. They're so extreme, they've provoked this kind of response. But now we have to protect ourselves. He breaks into a smile. And after the break, I'll be learning some fun self-defense moves you can practice at home. But first, the weather on the ones. Even here, even after all Tunde has seen, he can't really believe that this country is trying to kill most of its men. But he knows that these things have happened before. These things are always happening. The list of crimes punishable by death has grown longer. A newspaper announcement from a week old paper suggests that surly refusal to obey on three separate occasions will now be punishable by work detail. There are women here in the camp, caring for eight or ten men, 
who all huddle around her, vying for her approval, desperate to please, terrified of what might happen if she removed her name from their papers. Roxy could leave the camp at any time, but Tunde is alone here. On their third night in the camp, Roxy wakes a few moments before the first tang and crackle of the power blows the lamp strung along the central pathway of the camp. She must have heard something, or just felt it, the way the nylon is humming, the power in the air. She opens her eyes and blinks. The old instincts are still strung in her. She has not lost them, at least. She kicks Tunde's metal frame bed. Wake up! He's tangled half in and half out of the sleeping bag. He pushes the cover off him, and he's almost naked there. Distracting, even now. What? He says, then hopefully. Helicopter? Don't you wish, she says. Someone's attacking us. And then he's wide awake, pulling on his jeans and fleece. There's the smashing sound of glass and metal. Stay low to the ground, she says, and if you can, run into the woods and climb a tree. And then someone puts her hand to the central generator and summons all the power that is in her body and sends it hurtling through the machine, and the low lights burst into sparks and glass filaments all around the camp, and the darkness becomes absolute. Roxy hauls up the back of the tent, where it always leaked anyway, through the rotten stitching, and Tunde, bellies out, starts for the forest. She should follow him, she will, in a moment. But she pulls on a dark jacket with a deep hood, wraps a scarf around her face. She'll keep to the shadows, work her way around to the north. That'll be the safest route out, anyway. She wants to see what's going on, as if she could still turn anything to her will. Around her, there are already screams and shouts. She's lucky that her tent wasn't on the edge of the camp. Some are burning there already, probably with people still inside, and there's the sweet stench of petrol. It will be several minutes yet until everyone in this camp even knows what's happening, and that it is not an accident or a generator fire. Through the tents, by the red glow of the fire, she glimpses a short squat woman, setting a flame with the spark from her hands. The flash lights her face white for an instant. Roxy knows the look on her face. She's seen it before. The kind of face her dad would have said was a bad bet for business. Never keep someone on a job who likes it too much. She knows when she sees the single flash of that gleeful and hungry face, that they're not here to raid for what they can find. They're not here for anything that can be given. They start by rounding up the young men. They go tent to tent, pulling them down or setting them on fire so the occupants have to run out or burn. They're not neat about it, not methodical. They're looking for any halfway decent-looking young men. She was right to send Tunde into the forest. A wife, or perhaps a sister, tries to stop them from taking the pale-skinned, curly-haired man who's with her. She fights off two of them with precise and well-timed jolts to the chin and the temple. They overwhelm her easily and kill her with a particular brutality. One of them grabs the woman by the hair, and the other delivers a bolt directly through the woman's eyes, finger and thumb pressed against her eyeballs, the very liquid of them scrambled to a milky white. Even Roxy has to look away for a moment. She backs further into the forest, climbs a tree hand over hand, using a loop of rope to help her. By the time she's found a crisscross place where three branches meet, they have turned their attention to the man. He will not stop screaming. Two of the women take him by the throat and send a paralysis into his spine. One squats on top of him. She pulls off his trousers. He is not unconscious. His eyes are wide and glistening. He is struggling for breath. Another of the men tries to rush forward to help him and gets a crack to the temple for his trouble. The woman on top cups his balls and dick in her palm. She says something, laughs. The others laugh too. She tickles him there with the tip of a finger, makes a little crooning sound, as if she wants him to enjoy it. He can't speak. His throat is bulging. They might have broken his windpipe already. She puts her head to one side, makes a sad face at him. She might as well have said in any language in the world, 
What's the matter? Can't get it up. He tries to kick with his heels to get away from her, but it's too late for that. Roxy would like very much for this not to be happening. If she had it in her power, she would jump down from her concealed position and kill them. First these two by the tree. You could get those before anyone knew what you'd done. Then the three with knives would come for you, but you could dart to the left between the two oaks, so they'd have to come one by one. Then you'd have a knife. It would be easy. But that's not her position right now. And it is happening. No wishing on her part can stop it. Therefore, she watches to be a witness. The woman sitting on the man's chest applies her palm to his genitals. She starts with a low hum of a spark. He's still doing muffled screaming, trying to get away. It can't hurt too much yet. Roxy's done this herself to blokes, for both their fun. His cock comes up like a salute. They always do. Like a traitor. Like a fool. The woman makes a little smile appear across her face, raises her eyebrows, as if to say, See? Just needed some encouragement, didn't you? She holds his balls, tugs on them once, twice, just as if she were giving him a treat, and then jolts him fiercely right through the scrotum. It'd feel like a glass spike, driven straight through, like lacerations from the inside. He screams and arches his back, and then she unbuttons the crotch of her combat trousers and sits on his cock. Her mates are laughing now, and she's laughing too as she pumps herself up and down on him. She's got her hand firmly planted in the centre of his stomach, giving him a dose every time she thrusts up with bunched thighs. One of her mates has a cell phone. They photograph her there, straddling him. He throws his arm over his face, but they pull the arm back. No, no, they want to remember this. Her mates are egging her on. She starts to touch herself, moves faster, her hips rocking forward. She's really hurting him now, not in a measured and thoughtful way, not to extract the maximum pain in interesting ways, just brutally. It's easily done as you get close. Roxy's done it herself once or twice, scared some bloke. It'd be worse if you'd taken the glitter. The woman's got one hand on his chest, and every time she tips forward, she gives him a crackle across his torso. He's trying to push her hand away, and screaming and reaching out to the crowd around them for help, and begging in a slurred language Roxy wouldn't understand except that the sound of help me, oh God, help me, is the same in every language. When the woman comes, her mates roar their approval. She throws her head back and pushes her chest forward and lets go a huge blast right into the center of his body. She rises, smiling, and they all pat her on the back. And she's laughing and smiling still. She shakes herself like a dog, and like a dog looks hungry yet. They start up a chant, the same four or five words in a rhythm as they ruffle her hair and give each other fist bumps. The pale, curly-haired man had been stopped finally, and forever, by that last blast. His eyes are open, staring. The rivulets and streams of red scarring run across his chest and up around his throat. His prick is going to take a while to subside, but the rest of him is gone. Not even death throes. Not even twitching. The blood is even now pooling in his back, in his buttocks, in his heels. She'd put her hand on his heart and stopped him, dead. There is a noise that is different to grief. Sadness wails and cries out, and lets loose a sound to the heavens like a baby calling for its mother. That kind of noisy grief is hopeful. It believes that things can be put right, or that help can come. There is a different kind of sound to that. Babies left alone too long do not even cry. They become very still and quiet. They know no one is coming. There have been staring eyes in the dark, but there are no shrieks now. There is no rage. The men are quiet. Over on the other side of the camp, 
There are still women fighting the invaders to drive them back. And there are still men picking up rocks or pieces of metal to hurt the women with. But here, those who saw it make no sound. Two of the other soldiers kick at the body of the dead man a little. They scuff dirt up over it, which might be some sign of piety or shame, but leave it there soiled and bleeding and bruised and swollen and marked with the raised scars of pain, not dug into the earth at all. And they go looking for their own prizes. There is no sense in what is done here this day. There is no territory to be gained, or a particular wrong to be avenged, or even soldiers to be taken. They kill the older men in front of the younger, with palms to the faces and the throat, and one shows off her special skill of drawing crude effects upon the flesh with the tips of her fingers. Many of them take some of the men, and use them or simply play with them. They offer one man a choice between keeping his arms or his legs. He chooses legs, but they break their bargain. They know that no one cares what happens here. No one is here to protect these people, and no one is concerned for them. The bodies might lie in this wood for a dozen years, and no one would come this way. They do it because they can. In the hour before dawn, they are tired. But the power coursing through them, and the powder, and the things they've done, turn their eyes red and they cannot sleep. Roxy has not moved for hours. Her limbs are sore, and her ribs grind, and her scar is yet jagged across her collarbone. She feels exhausted by what she has seen, as if the very witnessing of it had been physical labor. She hears her name called softly, and she jumps, almost unseats herself from the tree. Her nerves are so jangled and her mind so confused. Since the thing that happened, she forgets sometimes now who she is. She needs someone to remind her. She looks to her left and right, and then sees him. Two trees over. Tunde is still alive. He's lashed himself to a branch with three coils of rope. But spotting her in the pre-dawn light, he starts to untie himself. After this night, he looks like home to her, and she can tell she looks the same to him, something familiar and secure in all of this. He climbs a little higher, where the branches meet and mingle, and hauls himself hand over hand towards her, finally dropping down softly in the little perch she's found. She's well hidden in a place where two great limbs of the tree meet, making a little nest of a thick branch that one person can rest their back on while the other leans on them. He drops down onto her. He's taken some injury she can tell in the night. He's broken something at his shoulder, and they lie heavily together. He reaches for her hand, interlaces his fingers with hers to keep them steady. They are both afraid. He smells fresh, like something green and budding. He says, I thought you were dead, when you didn't follow me. She says, Don't speak too soon. Could still be dead tonight. He makes a little rough breath, a sign in place of a laugh. He mutters, This also has been one of the dark places of the earth. They both fall, dazed for a few minutes, into a staring trance, a little like sleep. They should move, but the presence of a familiar body is too comforting to give up, for a moment. When they blink, there is someone in this tree, just beneath them, a woman in green fatigues, one hand in an army gauntlet, three fingers sparking as she climbs. She's shouting back down to someone on the ground. She's using her flashes to peer up through the trees, to burn the leaves. It's still dark enough that she can't see. Roxy remembers a time she and a couple of the girls heard there was a woman beating up her boyfriend in the street. It had to be stopped. You can't let that kind of thing keep on if you own a place. 
By the time they got there, it was just her, drunk, railing around the street, shouting and swearing. They found him in the end, hiding in the cupboard under the stairs. And although they tried to be good and kind, Roxy thought in her heart, Why didn't you fight back? Why didn't you try? You could have found a frying pan to hit her with. You could have found a spade. What good did you think hiding was going to do? And here she is, hiding, like a man. She's not sure what she is anymore. Tunde is resting on her, his eyes open, his body tense. He's seen the soldier, too. He stays still. Roxy stays still. They're concealed here, even as the dawn brings on more danger. If the soldier gives up, they could be safe. The woman climbs a little higher in the tree. She's setting fire to the lower branches, though for now they flare and then smolder out. There's been rain recently. That's lucky. One of her mates throws her up a long metal baton. They've had fun with this, inserting it and setting it crackling. She starts to sweep the upper boughs of the next tree over with this rod. No hiding place is perfect. The woman makes a swift jab. Too close to Roxy and Tunde. Too close. The tip of it ends no more than two arms reaches away from his face. When the woman raises her hand, Roxy can smell her. The yellow scent of sweat, the acid smell of the glitter metabolizing through the skin, the peppery radish of the power itself in use. The combination as familiar as Roxy's own skin. A woman with her strength up and no ability to contain it. Tunde whispers to her, Just shock her once. It conducts both ways. When the pole comes towards us next time, Grab it and shock her very hard. She'll fall to the floor. The others will have to look after her. We can get away. Roxy shakes her head, and there are tears in her eyes. And Tunde has a sudden feeling, as if his heart has opened, as if the wires around his chest have all at once unfurled. He has an idea of something. He thinks of the scar he's caught sight of at the edge of her collarbone how protective of it she is, and how she's bargained and threatened and charmed, and yet, has he seen her? Has she ever hurt anyone in his presence since she found him in the cage? Why was she hiding in the jungle? She, a monk, she the strongest there ever was. He had never thought of this before. He hasn't imagined for years what a woman could be without this thing, or how she could have it taken from her. The woman reaches with her rod again. The tip catches the back of Roxy's shoulder, sending an iron nail of pain into her. But she remains silent. Tunde looks around. Beneath the tree they're hiding in, there is only marshy ground. Behind them are the remains of several stomped flat tents and three women toying with a young man who is at his very limit. Ahead and to the right, there is the burned-out generator, and half-concealed by branches, an empty metal gasoline drum they've used as a rain collector. If it's full, it's no use to them. But it might be empty. The woman is calling back to her friends, who are shouting up words of encouragement to her. They've found someone hiding in one of the trees towards the entrance of the camp. They're looking for more. Tunde shifts position carefully. Movement will catch the soldiers' eyes, and then they'll be dead. They only need the soldiers distracted for a few minutes, just enough to get away. He reaches into his backpack, brutals his fingers through to an internal pocket, and pulls out three canisters of film. Roxy is breathing softly, watching him. She can tell from the way he's looking what he's going to try. He lets his right arm drop, like a vine detached from the tree, like nothing. He hefts the film canister in it and skims it towards the oil drum. Nothing. The throw was too short. The canister has thumped into the soft earth, dead as blood. The woman is climbing again and making those broad sweeps with a metal rod. 
He takes up another film canister, this one heavier than the other, and for a moment he's puzzled as to why. Then he remembers. This is the one he put his American change into, as if he'd ever use those pennies again. It almost makes him laugh. But it's good. It's heavy. It'll fly better. He has the momentary urge to bring it to his lips, like one of his uncles used to do, with a betting slip, when it was neck and neck and his whole body was tense like the racehorses on the screen. Go on, thing. Fly for me. He lets his hand dangle. He pendulums it back and forth once, twice, three times. Go on, come on, you want it! He lets it fly. The clang, when it comes, is so much louder than he'd expected. The canister has hit just at the rim. The noise means the vessel cannot be full of water. It is wild. The oil drum reverberates. It sounds intentional like someone announcing their arrival. Heads turn across the camp. Now, now, quickly he does it again, another canister, this one packed with matches against the wet. Heavy enough, another wild gong. Now it seems like there must be someone there, someone making a stand, some idiot calling the hurricane to descend on her. They come, quick, from around the camp. Roxy has time to pull a thick stump of branch off the tree, hurling it towards the oil drum to make one more bang and shout of metal before they're close enough to see what's happening. The woman who was so nearly on her scrambles down through the branches of the tree in her rush to be the first to pull up whichever fool it is who thought they could stand against these forces. Tunde's whole body is aching now. There is no differentiation between the sources of pain, the cramp and the broken bones, and there's little enough space between him and Roxy that when he looks down, he can see her wound and scarring, and it hurts him as if the line had been cut along his own body. He stretches himself by the arms, feeling with his feet for the broad lower branch, runs along it. Roxy's doing the same. They drop down, hoping that the cover is enough to hide the shape of movement from the women in the camp. Stumbling through the marshy earth, Tunde risks one single look back, and Roxy follows his gaze to see if the soldiers have tired of the empty oil drum now, to see if they are after them. They're not. The drum wasn't empty. The soldiers are kicking it, and laughing, and reaching in to lift out the contents. Tunde sees, and Roxy sees, as if in a camera's flash, what they have found. There were two children in the oil drum. They're lifting them out. They are perhaps five or six. They are sobbing, still curled tight into balls as they are lifted up. Tiny soft animals trying to protect themselves. A pair of blue trousers frayed at the bottom. Bare feet. A sundress spotted with yellow daisies. If Roxy had her power. She would return and turn every one of these women all to ash. As it is, Tunde grabs her hand and pulls her away, and they run on. Those children would never have survived. They might. They would have died there anyway of cold and exposure. They might have lived It is a cold dawn, and they run hand in hand, unwilling to let one another go. She knows the way of the land and the safest roads, and he knows how to find a quiet place to hide. They keep running until they can only walk, and still they walk on, mile after mile, in silence, palms pressed together. Towards dusk, he spots one of the deserted rail stations that populate this part of the country, waiting for Soviet trains that never came. They are mostly home to roosting birds now. They smash a window to pile in, and find a few mouldy cushions on wooden benches, and in a cupboard a single dry woolen blanket. They dare not make a fire, but they share the blanket, together, in a corner of the room. He says, I've done a terrible thing. And she says, You've saved my life. She says, You can't even believe half the things I've done, mate. Bad, bad things. And he says, and you saved my life. In the dark of the night, 
He tells her about Nina, and how she published his words and his photographs under her name, and how he knows by that that she was always waiting to take from him everything he had. And she tells him about Daryl, and what was taken from her, and in that telling, he knows everything. Why she carries herself like this, and why she's been hiding all these long weeks, and why she thinks she can't go home, and why she hasn't struck against Daryl at once, and with great fury, as a monk would do. She had half forgotten her own name, until he reminded her of it. One of them says, Why did they do it, Nina and Daryl? And the other answers, Because they could. That is the only answer there ever is. She holds his wrist, and he is not afraid. She runs her thumb along the palm of his hand. She says, The way I see it, I'm dead, and so are you. What do dead people do for fun around here? They are both injured and hurting. His collarbone, he thinks, is broken. There is a grinding pain in it every time he shifts position. Theoretically, he is stronger than her now. But this makes them both laugh. She is short and stocky like her dad, the same thick bull's neck, and she has fought more than him. She knows the ways of fighting. When he plays at pushing her back onto the ground, she plays at putting her thumb on the center of his pain, where the shoulder joins the neck. She presses just enough to make him see stars. He laughs, and she laughs, breathless and foolish in the middle of the storm. Their bodies have been rewritten by suffering. They have no fight left. They cannot in that moment tell which of them is supposed to be which. They are ready to begin. They move slowly. They keep their clothes half on. She traces the line of an old scar at his waist. He took it in Delhi when he first learned fear. He touches his lips to the livid line at her collarbone. They lie, side by side. After what they've seen, they cannot want it fast or hard now. Either of them. They touch one another gently, feeling out the places where they are alike and where they are different. He shows her he is ready, and she is ready too. They slide together simply, key in a lock. Ah, he says. Yes, she says. It's good. Her around him, him inside her. They fit. They move slowly and easily, taking account of each other's particular pains, smiling and sleepy and for a moment, without fear. They come with soft, animal grunts, snuffling into each other's necks, and fall asleep like that, legs intertwined underneath a found blanket in the center of a war. Audio Guide for the Museum of Post-Cataclysm Artifacts this artifact is a large stone carving affixed to a wall. It is flat, with a triangular roof piece supported by two pillars. There is a shield containing a cross under the triangular roof piece. The center of the carving has been completely obliterated. The display text reads, Exceptionally complete cataclysm-era carving, around 5,000 years old. Found in Western Britain. The carvings are uniformly found in this condition. Something has been deliberately removed from the center, but it is impossible to ascertain what was lost. Among the theories are that these stones framed portraits, or lists of local ordinances, or that they were simply a rectangular form of art with nothing in the center. The chiseling was clearly a protest against whatever was, or was not, 
represented by the central portion. Here it comes. These things are happening all at once. These things are one thing. They are the inevitable result of all that went before. The power seeks an outlet. These things have happened before. They will happen again. These things are always happening. The sky which had seemed blue and bright, clouds over, grey to black. There will be a rainstorm. It has been long in coming. The dust is parched. The soil longs for soaking, teeming dark water. For the earth is filled with violence, and every living thing has lost its way. In the north and the south, and the east and the west, the water gathers in the corners of the sky. In the south, Jocelyn Cleary puts up the hood of her jeep as she takes a concealed exit down a gravel track that looks like it might lead to something interesting. And in the north, Ola Tunde Edo and Roxanne Monk wait to hear the rain pounding on the iron roof of their shelter. And in the west, Mother Eve, who once went by the name of Ali, looks out at the gathering storm and says to herself, Is it time? And her own self says, Well, duh. There has been an atrocity to the north. Rumors of it have come from too many sources now to be denied. It was Tatiana's own forces, mad with power and maddened by delays and the orders that keep coming in, saying, Any man can betray you. Any of them could be working for the North. Or was it just that Tatiana has never bothered to control them properly? Maybe she'd always have gone mad, whatever Mother Eve had done to her. Roxy's gone. The forces are slipping out of Tatiana's control. There will be a military coup within weeks if someone doesn't take charge of this situation. And then North Moldova will march in and take the country and the stocks of chemical weapons in the southern cities. Ali sits in her quiet study, looking out at the storm, and counts the cost of business. The voice says, I've always told you that you are meant for great things. Ali says, Yes, I know. The voice says, You command respect not only here, but everywhere. Women would come here from around the world if you own the country. Ali says, I said, I know. The voice says, So what are you waiting for? Ali says, The world is trying to go back to its former shape. Everything we've done is not enough. There are still men with money and influence who can shape things to their will. Even if we win against the North, what are we starting here? The voice says, You want the whole world turned upside down? Ali says, Yes. The voice says, I feel you, but I don't know how to be any clearer about this. You can't get there from here. You'll have to start again. We'll have to begin again with the whole thing. Ali says in her heart, A great flood. The voice says, I mean, there's one way to handle it. But you've got a few options. Look, think it over. Once you've done the thing. It is late at night. Tatiana sits at her desk writing. There are orders to be signed to the generals. She is going to push forward against the North, and this is going to be a disaster. Mother Eve comes to stand behind her and places a comforting hand at the back of her neck. They've done this many times. Tatiana Moskalev finds the gesture soothing, although she cannot quite say what it is that makes it so. Tatiana says, I'm doing the right thing, aren't I? Ali says, God will always be with you. There are hidden cameras in this room, another artifact of Tatiana's paranoia. A clock strikes. 
One, two, three. Why then, tis time to do it. Ali reaches out with her particular sense and skill, calming each nerve in Tatiana's neck and shoulders, skull and cranium. Tatiana's eyes close, her head nods, and, as if it weren't part of her at all, as if for this moment she couldn't even detect what it's doing, Tatiana's hand creeps across the table to the sharp little letter opener lying on the pile of papers. Ali feels the muscles and nerves trying to resist, but they're used to her now, and she to them. Dampen down the reaction. Here, strengthen the one. There. It wouldn't be so easy if Tatiana hadn't drunk so much, and taken a concoction of Ali's own manufacture, something Roxy had cooked up for her in the labs. It's not easy now, but it can be done. Ali places her mind in Tatiana's hand, holding the letter opener. There's a smell suddenly in the room, a scent like rotten fruit, but the hidden cameras can't pick up a smell. In one swift movement, too fast for Mother Eve to do anything about it, how could she have suspected what was about to happen? Tatiana Muskalev, maddened by the crumbling of her power, slashes at her own throat with a sharp little knife. Mother Eve jumps back, screaming, shouting for help. Tatiana Moskalev bleeds out over the papers across her desk, her right hand still twitching, as if it were alive. Darrell. The sent me from the office, says the lumbering Irina. There is a soldier on one of the paths at the back. Shit. They watch through the closed-circuit TV. The factory's eight miles down a dirt track from the main road, and the entrance is concealed by hedges and forest. You'd have to know what you were looking for to find it. But there's a soldier. Just one, no sign of a larger party, not far from their perimeter fence. She's a mile out from the factory proper, all right. She can't even see it from where she is, but she's there, walking around the fence, taking photographs on her phone. The women in the office look at Daryl. They're all thinking, what would Roxy do? He can see it on their foreheads like they've written it there in marker pen. Daryl feels the skein in his chest start to throb and twist. He's been practicing with it after all. There's a part of Roxy right here, and that part knows just what to do. He's strong, mightier than the mightiest. He's not supposed to show any of these girls what he can do. Bernie's been very clear about that. The cat is not to be let out of the bag. Until he's ready to be shown off to the highest bidders in London as an example of what they can do, he's to keep it secret. The skein whispers to him, She's only one soldier. Go out there and give her a fright. Power knows what to do. It has a logic to it. He says, All of you, watch me. I'm going out. He talks to the skein as he walks down the long gravel path and opens the gate in the perimeter fence. He says, Don't fail me now. I'll pay good money for you. We can work together on this, you and me. The skein, obedient now, laid out along Darrell's collarbone as it had once been in Roxy's, begins to hum and sizzle. It is a good feeling. That is an aspect of the situation Darrell had suspected but not confirmed until now. Feels a little bit like being drunk. In a good way. In a strong way. Like that feeling you get when you're drunk, that you could take all comers. And in this case, you really could. The skein talks back to him. It says, I'm ready. It says, Come on, my son. It says, Whatever you need, I've got it. Power doesn't care who uses it. The skein doesn't rebel against him, doesn't know that he's not its rightful mistress. It just says, yes, yes, I can. Yes, you've got this. He lets a little arc pass between his finger and his thumb. He's still not used to that feeling. It buzzes uncomfortably on the surface of the skin, 
but it feels strong and right inside his chest. He should just let her go, but he can take her no sweat. That'll show them. When he looks back at the factory, the women are crowded around the windows watching him. A few of them are straying out onto the path to keep him in their eyeline. They're muttering to each other behind their hands. One of them makes a long arc between her palms. They're sinister fuckers, the way they move together. Roxy's gone too easy on them all these years, letting them have their weird little ceremonies and use the glitter in their off hours. They go into the woods together at sunset and don't come back till dawn, and he can't fucking say anything, can he? Because they turn up bang on time and they get the job done. But something's going on. He can tell it by the smell of them. They've made a little fucking culture here. And he knows they talk about him. And he knows they think he shouldn't be here. He crouches low, so she won't see him coming. Behind Daryl, the tide of women grows. Roxy says in the morning, when she and Tunde are dressed again, I can get you out of the country. He had forgotten, really, that there is an out of the country to get to. Already this feels more real and more inevitable than anything that has come before. He pauses halfway through pulling on a sock. He's left them to dry overnight. They still stink, and their texture is crisp and gravelly. How? he says. She shrugs one shoulder, smiles. I'm Roxy Monk. I know a few people around here. You want to get out? Yes, he does. Yes, he says to her. What about you? She says, I'm going to get my thing back, and then I'll come and find you. She's got something back already. She's twice her natural size. He thinks he likes her, but he has no way to know for certain. She has too much to offer him to be a simple proposition right now. She gives him a dozen ways to find her as they walk the long miles from here to there. This email inbox will go to her, even though it looks like a shell company. That person will always know how to reach her, eventually. She says more than once, You saved my life. And he knows what she means. At a crossroads between fields, next to a shelter for a twice-a-week bus, she uses a payphone to call a number she knows by heart. When the call's finished, she talks him through what's going to happen. A blonde woman in an airline hat will pick him up this evening and drive him across the border. He'll have to be in the boot, sorry, but that's the safest way. It'll take about eight hours. Waggle your feet, she says, or you'll get a cramp. It hurts, and you're not going to be able to get out. What about you? She laughs. I'm not getting in the boot of a bloody car, am I? What then? Don't worry about me. They part just after midnight, outside a tiny village whose name she cannot pronounce. She kisses him once, lightly on the mouth. She says, You'll be all right. He says, You're not staying. But he knows how this goes. The process of his life has taught him the answer. If she were seen taking particular care of a man, it'd make her look soft in her world, and it'd put him in danger if anyone thought he meant something to her. This way, he could be any kind of cargo. He says, Go and take it back. Anyone worth knowing will think more of you for surviving this long without it. Even as he says it, he knows it's not true. No one would think anything much of him for surviving this long. She says, if I don't try, I'm not myself anymore anyway. She walks on, taking the road to the south. He puts his hands into his pockets and his head down and strolls into the village, trying to look like a man sent on an errand that he has every right to be about. He finds the place, just as she described it. There are three shuttered shops, no lights in the windows above them, he thinks he sees a curtain twitch in one of the windows and tells himself he imagined it. There's no one waiting for him here and no one chasing him. When did he get so jumpy? And he knows when. It wasn't this last thing that made it happen. This fear has been building up in him. The terror put its roots down into his chest 
years ago. And every month and every hour has driven the tendrils a little deeper into the flesh. He can bear it somehow, in the moments when the imagined darkness matches the real. He hasn't felt this dread when he was actually in a cage, or in a tree, or witnessing the worst thing in the world unfold. The dread stalks him on quiet streets, or waking alone in a hotel room before dawn. It has been a long time since he's felt comfortable in a night walk. He checks his watch. He has ten minutes to wait on this empty street corner. He has a package in his bag, all of his camera film, all the footage he shot on the road, and his notebooks. He had that envelope ready from the start, stuck with stamps. He had a few. He thought if things got dicey he might post his film to Nina. He's not going to post anything to Nina. If he sees her again, he'll eat her heart in the marketplace. He has a marker pen. He has the envelope, packed neatly. And on the opposite corner of the street, there's a post box. How likely is it that the postal service is still working here? He'd heard in the camp that it did still work in the larger villages, the towns and cities. Things have broken down on the border and in the mountains, but they're miles from the border and the mountains now. The box is open. There's a time listed for a pickup tomorrow. He waits. He thinks. Maybe there will be no car. Maybe there will be a car, and instead of a blonde woman with a hat, there'll be three women who bundle him into the back seat. Maybe he'll end there, thrown out onto the road between one town and the next, used and torn. Maybe there'll be a blonde woman with a hat who'll take the money she's being paid for this and say she's crossed the border. She'll let him out of the car to run in the direction she tells him is freedom, but there'll be no freedom there. Only the forest and the chase and the end of it in the soil, one way or another. It suddenly seems a remarkably stupid thing to have trusted his whole life to Roxanne Monk. There is a car coming. He sees it from a long way off, its headlights sweeping the dirt road. He has time to write a name on this package and an address. Not Nina. Obviously not. Not Temmie or his parents. He can't let this be his final message to them if he disappears into this dark night. He has an idea. It is a terrible idea. It is a safe idea. If he doesn't come through this, there is one name and mailing address he could write on this package which would make sure the images would be sent around the world. People should know, he says to himself, what has happened here. To witness is the first responsibility. He has time. He scribbles quickly, without thinking too hard. He runs for the post box. He slots the package into the chute and closes the lid again. He is back in position when the car stops at the curb. There is a blonde woman behind the wheel, with a baseball cap pulled low over her eyes. There is a crest on it that says, Jet Life. She smiles. Her English is thickly accented. She says, Roxy Monk sent me. We'll be there before morning. She opens the back of the car. It's a sedan, roomy enough, though he'll have to keep his knees curled against his chest. Eight hours. She helps him climb into the trunk of the car. She is careful with him, gives him a rolled-up sweater to make a buffer between the back of his head and the metal housing. The trunk is clean, at least. As his nose meets the curled fibres of the interior carpet, he smells only the floral chemical scent of shampoo. She gives him a large bottle of water. When finished, can piss in bottle. He smiles up at her. He wants her to like him, to feel that he is a person, not a cargo. He says, traveling coach, huh? These seats get smaller every year. But he can't tell if she's understood his joke. She pats his thigh as he settles in. Trust me, she says, as she slams the trunk closed. From here, on the gravel path between nowhere and nothing, just around the corner of a screen of trees, Jocelyn can see a low-slung building, with windows only on the upper story. 
just the corner of it. She hoists herself onto a rock and takes some pictures. It's inconclusive. She should probably get closer, although that's a stupid idea. Be sensible, Joss. Report what you found and bring a unit back tomorrow. There's definitely something there that someone's gone to quite a lot of trouble to hide from the road. Although, what if it's nothing? What if this ends with everyone in the base laughing at her? She takes another few pictures. She's intent on it. She doesn't notice the man until he's almost standing next to her. What the fuck do you want? He says in English. She has a duty weapon by her side. She shifts position, allowing it to bang against her hip and move forward. I'm sorry, sir, she says. I've gotten turned around. I'm looking for the main highway. She keeps her voice very level and calm, turns her American accent up a bit without really intending to. Susie Cream Cheese, bumbling tourist. It's the wrong tack to take. She's in army fatigues. Pretending at innocence just makes her look more guilty. Daryl feels the skein pumping in his chest. It does it more when he's afraid, twitches and fizzes. What the fuck are you here for on my land? He says. Who sent you? Behind his back, he knows the women in the factory are observing the encounter with cold, dark eyes. There'll be no doubting him after this. There'll be no asking what he is. They'll know what he is when they see what he can do. He's not a man in women's clothing. He's one of them, as strong as them, as capable. She tries a smile. No one sent me, sir. I'm off duty, just doing a little sightseeing. I'll be on my way. She sees his eyes flick to the maps in her hand. If he sees those, he'll know she was looking for this place and no other. All right says Daryl. All right, let me get you back on your way. He doesn't want to help her. He's coming too close. She should call this in. Her hand twitches towards her radio. He reaches out three fingers of his right hand, and with a single swift jolt, he kills the radio dead. She blinks, sees him for a moment as himself. Monstrous. She tries to swing her rifle round, but he has it by the butt, Catches her in the chin with it, leaving her staggering, hauls the strap over her head. He considers the rifle, then tosses it into the undergrowth. He comes for her, palms crackling. She could run. There's her dad's voice in her head saying, Take care of yourself, sweetie. And there's her mom's voice in her head saying, You're a hero. Act like it. This is one guy with a factory in the middle of nowhere. How hard can it be? And the girls from the base. You of all people should know how to deal with one dude with a skein. Don't you, Jocelyn? Isn't this your special subject, Jocelyn? She has something to prove. And he has something to prove. They are ready to begin. They square off to each other, circling, looking for a weakness. Daryl's done little tests before. He gave minor burns and hurts and damage to a couple of the surgeons who worked with him, just to see if it'd work. And he's practiced alone, but he's never used it before in a fight not like this. It's exciting. He has a sense, he finds, of how much he's got left in the tank. It's loads. More than loads. He lunges for her and misses and lets an excited jolt earth through his feet. And he's still got loads. No wonder Blimmin' Roxy always looked so pleased with herself. She was carrying this round inside her. He'd have felt pleased with himself, too. He does. Jocelyn's skein is twitching. It's just because she's excited. It's working now better than it ever has. It's been so good since Mother Eve cured her. And now she knows why that happened. Why God made that miracle for her. It was for this, to save her from this bad man trying to kill her. She tightens her stomach and runs for him, fainting to the left, pretending to go for his knee, and at the last moment, as he's stooping to defend against her, she twists right, reaches up, grabs his ear, and gives him a jolt to the temple. It's smooth and easy, sweetly humming. He gets her on the thigh, and it hurts like fuck, like a rusty blade scraped along the bone. The big muscles just keep bunching and releasing, and the leg wants to collapse. She hauls herself upright with the right leg, dragging the left behind her. 
He's got a lot of power. She can feel it crackling on his skin. The kinds of jolts he gives are muscular and iron hard, not like Ryan's, not like anyone she's fought with. She remembers her training for fighting an opponent who is simply stronger, simply has more to work with. She's going to have to let him play himself out on her, presenting to him the bits of the body where he can do least damage. He's got more juice in the tank than she does, but if she can trick him into spending some into the earth, if she can be faster and more nimble than him, she'll have this. She backs away, dragging the leg a little more than she needs to. She makes herself stumble a little. She clutches at the hip. She watches him watching her. She holds out a warding hand. She lets the leg collapse under her. She falls to the ground. He's on her like the wolf on the lamb. But she's faster than him now, rolling to the side so that he discharges his killing blow into the gravel. He roars and she kicks him hard in the side of the head with her good leg. She reaches up to grab the back of his knee. She has it planned like they taught her. Bring him to the ground. Go for the knees and ankles. She has enough. One solid blow here where the ligaments join and he'll tumble. She grabs at his trousers and makes contact, her palm firm against his calf to jolt him. And there's nothing. It's gone. Like a motor revved to a standstill, like a pool of water drained into the earth. It's not there. It must be there. Mother Eve gave it back to her. It must be there. She tries again, concentrates, thinks of the stream of running water like they taught her in her classes, thinks of how it flows naturally from place to place. If she only allows it, she could find it again if she had just a moment. Daryl kicks her hard in the jaw with his heel. He'd also been waiting for the blow that didn't come, but he's not one to waste his chance. She's kneeling now on all fours, gasping, and he kicks her in the side once, twice, three times. He can smell bitter oranges suddenly, and a scent like burned hair. He pushes her head down with the heel of his hand, delivering a charge to the base of her skull. It becomes impossible to fight with a jolt there. He knows it was done to him once long ago in a park at night. The mind becomes confused, the body goes limp, there is nothing to be done. He holds the charge steady. The soldier sinks to the floor, her face in the gravel. He waits until she's stopped twitching. He's breathing heavily. He has enough juice left to do the same thing twice over. It feels good. She's gone. Daryl looks up, smiling, as if the trees should applaud his victory. In the distance, he hears the women pick up a song, a melody he's heard them sing before, but which none of them will explain to him. He sees the dark eyes of the women watching him from the factory. He knows something then. A simple fact that should have been obvious from the first had he not been pushing the knowledge from him. The women are not glad to see what he has done, or that he could do it. The fucking bitches are just staring at him. Their mouths are as closed as the earth, their eyes as blank as the sea. They walk down the stairs inside the factory in orderly file, and march towards him as one. Daryl lets out a sound, a hunted cry, and he runs, and the women are after him. He is heading for the road. It's only a few miles away. On the road, he'll flag down a car. He'll get away from these crazy bitches. Even in this godforsaken country, someone will help him. He runs. Pell-mell across an open plain between two great bodies of trees, feet pushing off from the ground as if he could become a bird now, a stream now, a tree now. He's in open country, and he knows they can see him and they are making no sound, and he lets himself think. Maybe they've turned back. Maybe they're gone. He looks behind him. There are a hundred women, and the sound of their muttering is like the sea, and they are gaining on him, and his ankle turns and twists and he falls. He knows them all by name. There's Irina, and clever Magda, Veronica, and blonde Yevgenia, and dark Yevgenia. There's cautious Nastya, and cheery Marinella, 
and young Justina. All of them are there. The women he's worked alongside these months and years, the women he's given employment to and treated fairly, in the circumstances. And there's a look on their faces that he cannot read. Come on now, he calls to them. I got rid of that soldier for you. Come on, Evgenia, did you see me? I took her down with one zap. Did you all see that? He's pushing himself away with his one good foot, as if he could scoot on bum and hip for the shelter of the trees or the mountain. He knows they know what he's done. They are calling to each other. He cannot hear precisely what it is they're saying. It sounds like a collection of vowels, a cry from the throat. Eoi, eoi, eoi. Ladies, he says as they run nearer and nearer yet. I don't know what you think you saw, but I just hit her on the back of the neck, fair and square, I just hit her. He knows he is speaking, but he cannot see any recognition in their faces. I'm sorry, says Daryl. I'm sorry, I didn't mean it. They are humming the ancient song softly. Please, he says. Please don't. And they're on him. Their hands find bare flesh. Their grasping, pulling fingers on his stomach and his back, the sides of him, his thighs and armpits. He tries to jolt them, tries to grab at them with hands and teeth. They let him discharge himself into their bodies and still they come. Magda and Marinella, Veronica and Irina, grabbing hold of his limbs and setting the power across the surface of his skin, scarring him and marking him and digging into his flesh, softening his joints and twisting them. Nastia places her fingertips at his throat and makes him speak. They're not his words. His mouth is moving and his voice is humming, but it is not him speaking. It's not. His lying throat says, Thank you. Irina places her foot in his armpit and hauls on his right arm, shocking and burning it. The flesh at the joint crisps and turns. She has the ball out of the socket. Magda pulls with her and they have the arm off. The others are at his legs and his neck and the other arm and the place across his collarbone where his ambition sat. Like the wind stripping the leaves from a tree, so inexorable and so violent. They pull the skein, lithe and wriggling, from his living chest just before they get his head off. And at last, he is quiet, their fingers dark with his blood. When she makes the call for Tunde, it has to be the start. Roxy Monk is coming back. My brother, she says on the phone. My fucking brother betrayed me and tried to have me killed. The voice on the phone is excited. I knew he was lying, a little shit. I knew he was lying. The women in the factory said he told them he was getting orders from you, and I fucking knew he was lying. I've been gathering my strength says Roxy, and make him our plans, and now I will take back from him what he took from me. So she has to make it true. She gathers a small force. No one's answering the phone at the factory, so some fucking thing has happened. She figures he might have people with him, even if he thinks she's dead. He'd have to be a fucking idiot to think no one would try to take the factory from him. She's expecting to have to mount an assault, but the gates of the factory are open. Her workers are all sitting on the lawns. They greet her with wild whoops, a sound that echoes across the lake, caught up and passed between the crowd of them. How did she ever think that she would not be welcomed back here, cripple as she is? How could she have imagined she couldn't allow herself to return? Her coming home is a festival. They say, We knew you were coming back. We saw it. We knew that you were the one we were waiting for. They crowd around her. They touch her hand. They ask where she's been and if she's found a new place for the factory. The war coming so close and the soldiers so intent on finding them. The soldiers? United Nations soldiers, they say. We've yet to put them off the scent more than once now. Yeah, says Roxy. You did that without Daryl, did you? A look passes between the women, hooded and mysterious. Irina puts her arm around Roxy's shoulder. Roxy thinks she can smell something on her. A smell like sweat, but more soupy. A rotten tang to it, like period blood. They've been 
tweaking the drug here. Roxy knows it and never stopped it. They've been taking off-label product. They go into the woods and do it on the weekends. It makes their sweat smell like mold. There's blue paint under their fingernails. Irina squeezes Roxy tightly. She thinks the woman's going to pick her up. Magda takes her hand. They walk with her towards the cold storage fridge where they keep the volatile chemicals. They open the door. Inside on the cold table is a collection of lumps of meat, raw and bloody. She cannot for a moment imagine why they are showing her this. And then she knows. What have you done? She says. What the fuck have you done? Roxy finds it there, in amongst the blood and mush. Her own self, a beating heart, the part of her that powered all the rest, a thin and rotting piece of gristle, the muscles striated purple and red. There was a day, three days after Daryl took it from her, that she realized she wasn't going to die. The spasms across her chest had ceased. The red and yellow flashes had disappeared from her eyes. She had bandaged herself up and walked to a hut she knew in the woods and waited there for death. But on the third day, she knew death was not going to take her. She thought then, It's because my heart is still alive. Outside my body, in his body, but still alive. She thought, I would know if it were dead. But she hadn't known. She holds her palm to her collarbone. She waits to feel something. Mother Eve comes to meet Roxanne Monk off the Midnight Army transport into the train station in Bazarabiaska, a city a little to the south. She could have waited for Roxy in the palace, but she wanted to see her face. Roxy Monk is thinner. She looks pained and worn. Mother Eve holds her in a tight embrace forgetting for a moment to probe or question with her special sense. There's the smell of her friend, just the same, pine needles and sweet almonds. There's the feeling of her. Roxy pulls away awkwardly. Something's wrong. She's almost silent as they drive through the empty streets to the palace. You're the president now, then? Ali smiles. It couldn't wait. She pats the back of Roxy's hand, and Roxy moves the hand away. Now you're back? We should talk about the future. Roxy smiles a tight, thin-lipped smile. In Mother Eve's apartments in the palace, when the last door is closed and the last person is gone, Ali looks at her friend wonderingly. I thought you were dead, she says. I almost was, says Roxy. But you came back to life. The one the voice told me was coming. You are a sign, says Ali. You are my sign, just as you always were. God's favor is with me. Roxy says, don't know about that. She undoes the top three buttons of her T-shirt to show what's there to be seen. And Ali sees it and she understands that this sign which she hoped would point in one direction is pointing entirely in another. There was a symbol that God placed in the sky after the last time she destroyed the world. She licked her thumb and drew an arc across the heavens, spreading the multitude of color and sealing her promise that she would never again flood the face of the earth. Ali looks at the crooked, upside-down bow of the curved scar across Roxy's chest. She draws her fingertips along it gently, and though Roxy looks away, she lets her friend touch her wound. The rainbow. Inverted. You were the strongest one I ever knew, she says. And even you have been brought low, Roxy says. I wanted you to know the truth. You were right, says Ali. I know what this means.
never again. The promise written across the clouds. This thing cannot be allowed to happen again. Listen, says Roxy. We should talk about the North. The war. You're a powerful woman now. She makes a little half smile. You always was on your way somewhere. But there's bad things happening up there. I've been thinking. Maybe you and me together can find a way to stop it. There's only one way to stop it, says Mother Eve, calmly. I just think, I don't know, we could work it out somehow. I could go on telly, talk about what I've seen, what's happened to me. Oh, yes, show them the scar. Tell what your brother did to you. There would be no stopping the fury then. The war would begin in earnest. No, that's not what I mean. No, Eve. You don't understand. It's going to absolute shit up there. I mean, crazy fucking batshit weirdo religious nutcases going around killing kids. He says, There's only one way to put it right. The war has to start now. The real war. The war of all against all. Gog and Magog, whispers the voice. That's right. Roxy sits back a little bit in her chair. She's told Mother Eve the whole story, every last part of what she saw and what was done to her and what she was made to do. We have to stop the war, she says. I still know how to get stuff done, you know. I've been thinking. Put me in charge of the army in the north. I'll keep order. We'll patrol the border. Real borders, like a real country. And, you know, we'll talk to your friends in America. They don't want fucking Armageddon breaking out here. God knows what weapons a wild your teeth has. Mother Eve says, You want to make peace? Yeah? You want to make peace? You want to take charge of the army in the north? Well, yeah. Mother Eve's head starts to shake as if someone else is shaking it for her. She gestures to Roxy's chest. Why would anyone take you seriously now? Roxy jerks her whole body away. She blinks. She says, You want to start Armageddon? Mother Eve says, Is the only way. It's the only way to win. Roxy says, Do you know what's going to happen? We'll bomb them and they'll bomb us and it'll spread out wider and wider and America will get involved and Russia and the Middle East and... The women will suffer as much as the men, Evie. The women will die just as much as the men will if we bomb ourselves back to the Stone Age. And then we will be in the Stone Age. Uh, yeah? And then, there will be 5,000 years of rebuilding. 5,000 years where the only thing that matters is, can you hurt more? Can you do more damage? Can you instill fear? Yeah. And then, the women will win. A silence spreads through the room and into Roxy's bones, up through the marrow, a cold, liquid stillness. Bloody hell, says Roxy. So many people have told me you're crazy, you know, and I never believed any of them. Mother Eve watches her with great serenity. I was always like, no, if you met her you'd know she's clever, and she's been through a lot, but she's not crazy. She sighs, looks at her hands, palms and backs. I went looking for information about you ages ago. I mean, I had to know. Mother Eve watches her, as if from very far away. It's not that hard to find out who you used to be. It's all over some bits of the internet. Alison Montgomery Taylor. Roxy takes her time with the words. I know, says Mother Eve. I know it was you who made it all disappear, and I'm grateful. 
if that's what you're asking. I'm still grateful. But Roxy frowns. And in that frown, Allie knows she's made a mistake somewhere along the line. Some little minor misalignment in her understanding. Roxy says, I'll get it, right? If you killed him, he probably deserved killing. But you should go and look at what his wife's doing now. She's called Williams now. Remarried a Lyle Williams in Jacksonville. She's still there. You should go and look her up. Roxy stands up. Don't do this, she says. Please don't. Mother Eve says, I'll always love you. Roxy says, Yeah, I know. Mother Eve says, It's the only way. If I don't do it, they will. Roxy says, If you really want the women to win, go and look up La Williams in Jacksonville and his wife. Allie lights a cigarette in the quiet of a stone room in the convent overlooking the lake. She brings it to flame in the old way, with a spark from her fingertips. The paper crackles and blackens into glowing light. She breathes it in to the edges of her lungs. She is full of her old self. She has not smoked for years. Her head swims. It is not hard to find Mrs. Montgomery Taylor. One, two, three words typed into a search box, and there she is. She runs a children's home now, under the auspices and with the blessing of the new church. She was an early member there in Jacksonville. In a photograph on the website of their children's home, her husband stands behind her. He looks a great deal like Mr. Montgomery Taylor. A shade taller, perhaps. A little bushier in the moustache, a little rounder in the cheek. Different colouring. A different mouth, but the same broad category of man. A weak man. The kind of man who, before any of this, would still have done what he was told. Or perhaps she's remembering Mr. Montgomery Taylor. They look sufficiently similar that Ali finds herself rubbing her jaw in the place where Mr. Montgomery Taylor hit her, as if the blow had landed only moments ago. Lyle Williams and his wife, Eve Williams. And together they care for children. It is Ali's own church that has made this thing possible. Mrs. Montgomery Taylor did always know how to work a system to best advantage. The website for the children's home she operates talks about the love and discipline and tender respect they teach. She could have looked any time. She cannot think why she has not turned on this old light before. The voice is saying things. It's saying, don't do it. It's saying, turn away. It's saying, step away from the tree, Eve with your hands up. Ali doesn't listen. Ali picks up the handset of the telephone on the desk here in the convent room overlooking the lake. She dials a number. Far away in a hallway with a side table topped by a crocheted runner, a telephone rings. Hello, says Mrs. Montgomery Taylor. Hello, says Ali. Oh, Allison, says Mrs. Montgomery Taylor. I hoped you'd call. Like the first drops of rain, like the earth saying, I'm ready for it. Come and get me. Ali says, What have you done? Mrs. Montgomery Taylor says, Just what the Spirit has commanded me to do. Because she knows what Ali means. Somewhere inside her heart, for all the twisting and turning, she does know, as she's always known. Allie can see in that moment that, 
everything will disappear, is a fantasy, has always been a delightful dream. Not the past, not the lines of pain inscribed on the human body, not a thing will ever disappear. While Ali has been making her life, Mrs. Montgomery Taylor has also continued growing monstrous as the clock turned. Mrs. Montgomery Taylor keeps up a bright line of chatter. She's so honored to receive a telephone call from Mother Eve, although she always knew she would. She understood what was meant by the name Allie had taken on, that she was Allie's real mother, her spiritual mother, and hasn't Mother Eve always said that the mother is greater than the child? She understood what was meant by that, too, that the mother is the one who knows best. She is so happy, so delighted, that Allie understood that everything she and Clyde did, they did for her own good. Allie feels sick. You were just a young girl, so wild, says Mrs. Montgomery Taylor. It drove us to distraction. I saw that the devil was in you. Allie remembers it now. As she has not brought it out into the light these many years. She pulls it from the back of her mind. She blows the dust from this heap of rags and bones. She stirs them with a fingertip. She arrived at the home of the Montgomery Taylors, a jangled child, beady and bird-like and wild, her eyes seeing everything, her hands in everything. It was Mrs. Montgomery Taylor who brought her, and Mrs. Montgomery Taylor who wanted her, and Mrs. Montgomery Taylor who spanked her when her hand was in the raisin jar. It was Mrs. Montgomery Taylor who grabbed her arm and threw her to her knees and commanded her to pray that the Lord would forgive her sin over and over on her knees. We had to drive that devil out of you. You see that now, don't you? Says Mrs. Montgomery Taylor, now Mrs. Williams. And Allie does see it. It is as clear to her now as if she were watching it through the glass panes of their own sitting room. Mrs. Montgomery Taylor tried to pray the devil out of her, and then to beat the devil out of her. And then she had a new idea. Everything we did, she says, we did for love of you. You needed to be taught discipline. She remembers the nights Mrs. Montgomery Taylor would put the polka on the radio real loud, and then Mr. Montgomery Taylor would ascend the stairs to give her the teachings. She remembers all at once and with great clarity which order those steps occurred in. First, the polka music, then the ascent of the stairs. Beneath every story, there is another story. There is a hand within the hand. Hasn't Allie learned that well enough? There is a blow behind the blow. Mrs. Montgomery Taylor's voice is sly and confidential. I was the first member of your new church in Jacksonville, Mother. When I saw you on the television, I knew that God had sent you to me as a sign. I knew that she was working through me when we took you in, and that she knew all that I had done, I had done for her glory. I was the one who made the police documents disappear. I've been caring for you all these years, darling. Allie thinks of all that was done in the house of Mrs. Montgomery Taylor. She cannot pull apart the strands of it, has never separated the experiences into individual moments to examine each one closely and particularly. Remembering it, is like a sudden flash of light upon carnage. Body parts and machinery and chaos and a sound that builds from a reedy cry to a full-throated scream and then cuts off to a low, humming, almost silence. You understand, she says, that God was working in us. All that we did, Clyde and I, we did so that you would be here. It was her touch, she felt every time Mr. Montgomery Taylor laid himself upon her. She cuppeth the power in her hand. She commandeth it to strike. Ali says, You told him to hurt me. 
and Mrs. Montgomery Taylor. Now Mrs. Williams says, We didn't know what else to do with you, Angel. You just wouldn't listen to anything we said. And do you do the same now with other children? With the children in your care? But Mrs. Montgomery Taylor, now Williams, has always been shrewd, even in her madness. All children need different kinds of love, she says. We do what's needed to care for them. Children are born so small. It does not matter if they are boys or girls. They are all born so weak and so powerless. Allie comes to pieces quite gently. All the violence in her has been spent out a hundred times. When this thing happens, she is calm, floating above the storm, watching the raging sea below. She puts the fragments together, sorting and resorting them. How much would it take to put it right? Investigations and press conferences and admissions. If it is Mrs. Montgomery Taylor, it is others too. More than she can count, probably. Her own reputation will suffer. Everything will come out, her past and her story and the lies and half-truths. She could move Mrs. Montgomery Taylor quietly on elsewhere. She might even find a way to have her killed. But to denounce her would be to denounce everything. If she roots this out, she roots out herself. Her own roots are rotten already. And with this, she is undone. Her mind disconnects from itself. For a while, she's not here. The voice tries to speak, but the howling of the wind inside her skull is too loud, and the other voice is now too numerous. In her mind for a time, it is the war of all against all. It cannot sustain. After a while, she says to the voice, Is this what it's like to be you? And the voice says, Fuck you. I told you not to do it. You should never have been friends with that monk. I told you and you wouldn't listen. She was just a soldier. What did you need a friend for? You had me. You always had me. Allie says, I never had anything. The voice says, Well, what now then, if you're so clever? Allie says, I keep meaning to ask, Who are you? I've wondered for a while. Are you the serpent? The voice says, Oh, you think because I swear and tell you to do stuff, I must be the devil? It's crossed my mind. And here we are. How am I supposed to tell which side is good and which is bad? The voice takes a deep breath. Ali's never heard it do that before. Look, says the voice. We've reached a tricky moment here. I'll give you that. There were things you were never supposed to look at. And now you've gone and looked at them. The whole point of me was to keep things simple for you. You see, that's what you wanted. Simple. Feel safe. Certainty. Feel safe. I don't know if you're aware, says the voice. But you're lying on the floor of your office right now, with the phone cradled under your right ear, listening to the sound of... Beep, beep, beep. And you won't stop shaking. At some point, someone's gonna come in and find you like this. You're a powerful woman. If you're not back soon, bad things are gonna happen. So I'm giving you the crib sheet right now. Maybe you'll understand it. Maybe you won't. Your whole question is the mistake. Who's the serpent? And who's the holy mother? 
Who's bad and who's good? Who persuaded the other to eat the apple? Who has the power and who's powerless? All of these questions are the wrong question. It's more complicated than that, sugar. However complicated you think it is, everything is always more complicated than that. There are no shortcuts. Not to understanding and not to knowledge. You can't put anyone into a box. Listen, even a stone isn't the same as any other stone. So I don't know where y'all think you get off labeling humans with simple words and thinking you know everything you need. But most people can't live that way, even some of the time. They say only exceptional people can cross the borders. Truth is, anyone can cross. Everyone has it in them but only exceptional people can bear to look it in the eye. Look, I'm not even real. Or not real like you think real means. I'm here to tell you what you want to hear. But the things you people want, I'm telling you. Long time ago, says the voice, another prophet came to tell me, that some people I'd made friends with wanted a king. I told them what a king would do. He'd take their sons for soldiers and their daughters for cooks. I mean, if the daughters were lucky, right? He'd tax their grain and their wine and their cows. These weren't people with iPads, you feel me? Grain and wine and cows were what they had. I said, look, a king will basically make you into slaves. And don't come crying to me when that happens. That's what kings do. What can I tell you? Welcome to the human race. You people like to pretend things are simple, even at your own cost. They still wanted a king. Ali says, Are you trying to tell me there's literally no right choice here? The voice says, There's never been a right choice, honey bun. The whole idea that there are two things and you have to choose is a problem. Ali says, And what shall I do? The voice says, Listen, I'll level with you. My optimism about the human race is not what it once was. I'm sorry it can't be simple for you anymore. Ali says, It's getting dark. The voice says, Sure is. Ali says, Welp. I see what you're saying. Been nice working with you. The voice says, Likewise. See you on the other side. Mother Eve opens her eyes. The voices in her head are gone. She knows what to do. Audio guide for the Museum of Post-Cataclysm Artifacts. This case contains part of a wooden figure. It is the torso of the sun in agony, a minor cultic figure. Like the carved female wooden figures in the nearby display case, this carving is approximately 500 years old. On the desk of Margot's assistant, a phone rings. She's in a meeting, the assistant tells a voice on the other end of the line that Senator Cleary can't be reached right now, but she can take a message. Senator Cleary is in a meeting with North Star Industries and the Department of Defense. They want her advice. She's an important person now. She has the ear of the president. Senator Cleary cannot be disturbed. The voice on the other end of the line speaks a few more words. 
They sit Margot on the cream-colored couch in her own office. When they tell her, they say, Senator Cleary, we have bad news. We've had word from the UN. She's been found in the woods. She's still alive, just barely. Her injuries are extensive. We don't know if she'll pull through. We think we know what happened. The man is dead already. We're so sorry, Senator. We're so sorry. And Margot is falling. Her own daughter, who put the tips of her fingers in the center of Margot's palm once and gave her the lightning, who curled her little waving hand around Margot's thumb once and held on so tightly that Margot knew for the first time that she was the strong one. Now and forever she would put her body between this little scrap and harm. That was her job. There was a time when Jocelyn was three. They were exploring the apple orchard at her parents' farm together. Mom and little daughter, with the slow intensity with which a three-year-old examines each leaf and stone and splinter. It was late autumn. The windfalls just turning to rot. Joss stooped down, turned over one of the browning fruit, and a cloud of wasps flew from it. Margot had always had a particular terror of wasps ever since a child. She grabbed Joss and wrapped her arms around her, holding her close to her body. Grabbed her and ran for the house. Joss was fine, not a scratch on her. And Margot, when they were comfortably seated on the couch again, found that she had been stung seven times, all the way down her good right arm. She had not even felt it. That was her job. She finds she's telling them this story. In a gabble, in a moan, she cannot stop telling this story, as if by telling it, she could go back now just a little way along the path and put her body between Joss and the harm that found her. Margot says, How can we stop this happening? They tell the senator it has already happened. Margot says, No. How can we stop it happening again? There is a voice in Margot's head. It says, You can't get there from here. She sees it all in that instant. The shape of the tree of power. Root to tip, branching and rebranching. Of course, the old tree still stands. There is only one way, and that is to blast it entirely to pieces. In a mailbox in rural Idaho, a package sits unclaimed for 36 hours. It is a yellow, padded envelope, about the size of three paperback books, though it rattles a little when shaken. The man who was sent to the post office for it feels it suspiciously. It has no return address, doubly suspicious. But there's no solid bulk that might indicate a homemade bomb. He slits it open along the side with a pocket knife, just to be certain. Into the palm of his hand tumble eight undeveloped rolls of photographic film one by one. He peers in further. There are notebooks and USB sticks. He blinks. He's not a smart man though he is a cunning one. He hesitates for a moment, thinking this package might be just another piece of junk sent to the group by men who are more crazy than disaffected. They've wasted time before on meaningless trash that men claimed represented the start of the new order. He's been personally berated by urban docs for bringing back parcels that might contain tracking devices within homemade muffins or inexplicable gifts of jockey shorts and lube. He pulls a handful of the notes out at random and reads the even hand. For the first time today on the road, I was afraid. He sits in his pickup truck, considering it. There have been others he's thrown away without hesitation. Others he knows he must bring back. In the end, 
The thought slowly crosses his mind that the camera films, or the USB sticks, might contain nudie pictures. Might as well see what they are anyway. The man in the pickup tips the rolls of film back into the envelope and pokes the notes in after them. Might as well. Mother Eve says, When a multitude speaks with one voice, that is strength, and that is power. The crowd roars its assent. We speak with one voice now, she says. We are one mind, and we call upon America to join us in the struggle against the North. Mother Eve holds up her hands for silence showing the eyes in the center of her palms. Well, the greatest nation on the earth, the land where I was born and raised, look on while innocent women are slaughtered and while freedom is destroyed. Will they watch in silence while we burn? If they abandon us, who will they not abandon? I call on women across the world to bear witness to what happens here. Bear witness and learn what you can expect to happen to you. If there are women in your government, hold them to account. Call on them to act. Convent walls are thick, and convent women are clever. And when Mother Eve warns them that the apocalypse is near at hand, and only the righteous will be saved, she can call the world to a new order. The end of all flesh is near because the earth is filled with violence. Therefore, build an ark. It will be simple. That is all they want. There are days that follow one after the next after the next. While Jocelyn heals, and while it becomes clear that she will never fully heal, and while something hardens in Margot's heart, she appears on the television to talk about Joss's injuries. She says, Terrorism can strike anywhere. At home or abroad. She says, The most important thing is that our enemies, both global and domestic, must know that we are strong and that we will retaliate. She looks down the camera lens and says, Whoever you are, we will retaliate. She can't afford to look weak, not at a time like this. It's not long after that when the phone call comes. They say there's been a credible threat from an extremist group. They've gotten hold somehow of pictures from inside the Republic of the Women, pasted them all over the internet saying they were taken by a guy we all know has been dead for weeks. Terrible pictures, probably photoshopped, can't be real. They're not even making demands, just rage and fear and threats of attacks unless God, I don't know, Margot, unless something is done, I guess. The North is already threatening Bessapara with missiles over it. Margot says, We should do something. The President says, I don't know. I feel like I should extend an olive branch. And Margot says, Believe me, in a moment like this, you need to appear stronger than ever. A strong leader. If that nation has been assisting in radicalizing our homegrown terrorists, we must send them a message. The world must know that the United States is willing to escalate. If you hit us with one jolt, we will hit you with two. The president says, I can't tell you how much I respect you, Margot, for the way you can carry on even with what's happened. Margot says, My country comes first. We need strong leadership. There is a bonus in her contract if North Star deployments around the world top 50,000 women this year. The bonus would buy her a private island. The president says, You know there are rumors that they got hold of ex-Soviet chemical weapons. And Margot thinks in her heart, Burn it all down. There is a thought in those days. It is that, Five thousand years is not a very long time. Something has been started now that must find its conclusion. When a person has taken a wrong turn, must she not retrace her steps? Is that not wise? 
After all, we've done it before. We can do it again. Different this time. Better this time. Dismantle the old house and begin again. When the historians talk of this moment, they talk about tensions and global instability. They posit the resurgence of old structures and the inflexibility of existing belief patterns. Power has her ways. She acts on people, and people act on her. When does power exist? Only in the moment it is exercised. To the woman with a skein, everything looks like a fight. Urban Doc says, Do it. Margot says, Do it. Awadi Atif says, Do it. Mother Eve says, Do it. And can you call back the lightning? Or does it return to your hand? Roxy sits with her father on the balcony, looking out at the ocean. It's nice to think that whatever happens, the sea will always be here. Well, Dad, says Roxy. You fucked that one up, didn't you? Bernie looks at his hands, palms and back. Roxy remembers when those hands were the most terrifying thing in the world to her. Yeah, he says. Suppose so. Roxy says with a smile in her voice. Learned your lesson, have you? You'll do it differently next time. And they're both laughing. Bernie's head ticked back to the sky and all his nicotine-stained teeth and filling showing. I should kill you, really says Roxy. Yeah, you should, really. Can't afford to be soft, girl. That's what they keep telling me. Maybe I've learned my lesson. Took me long enough. At the horizon, there is a flash across the skyline. Pink and brown, although it is nearly midnight. Bit of nice news, she says. I think I've met a bloke. Yeah? Early days, she says. With all this, it's a bit complicated. But yeah, maybe. I like him. He likes me. She laughs her old throaty growl. I got him out of a country full of mad women trying to kill him. And I own an underground bunker, so obviously he likes me. Grandchildren? says Bernie, hopefully. Daryl and Terry are gone. Ricky's not going to be able to do anything in that department ever again. Roxy shrugs. Might do. Someone's got to survive these things, haven't they? A thought occurs to her. She smiles. Bet if I had a daughter, she'd be strong as fuck. They have another drink before they go down. Apocrypha, excluded from the Book of Eve. Discovered in a cave in Cappadocia, circa 1,500 years old. The shape of power is always the same. It is infinite. It is complex. It is forever branching. While it is alive like a tree, it is growing. While it contains itself, it is a multitude. Its directions are unpredictable. It obeys its own laws. No one can observe the acorn and extrapolate each vein in each leaf of the oak crown. The closer you look, the more various it becomes. However complex you think it is, it is more complex than that. Like the rivers to the ocean, like the lightning strike, it is obscene and uncontained. A human being is made not by our own will, but by that same organic, inconceivable, unpredictable, uncontrollable process that drives the unfurling leaves in season and the tiny twigs to bud 
and the roots to spread in tangled complications. Even a stone is not the same as any other stone. There is no shape to anything except the shape it has. Every name we give ourselves is wrong. Our dreams are more true than our waking. Dear Neil, Well, I must say, first of all, that I like your contortionist Mother Eve. I've seen some of those things done at the underground circus, and I've been very impressed. One of those women made my hand wave at everyone in the room, and even Salim could hardly believe afterwards that I hadn't done it myself. I suppose lots of things in the ancient scriptures can be accounted for that way. And I see what you've done with Tunde. I'm sure something like that has happened to thousands of men down the generations. Misattributions, anonymous work assumed to be female, men helping their wives or sisters or mothers with their work and getting no credit. And, yes, simple theft. I have some questions. The male soldiers at the start of the book. I know you're going to tell me that ancient excavations have found male warrior figures. But really, I suppose this is the crux of the matter for me. Are we sure those weren't just isolated civilizations, one or two amongst millions. We were taught in school about women making men fight for entertainment. I think a lot of your readers will still have that in mind when you have those scenes where men are soldiers in India or Arabia, or those feisty men trying to provoke a war, or gangs of men locking up women for sex. Some of us have had fantasies like that. Can I confess? Shall I confess that while thinking about this, I... No, no, I can't confess it. It's not just me, though, my dear. A whole battalion of men in army fatigues or police uniforms really does make most people think of some kind of sexual fetish, I'm afraid. I'm sure you learned the same thing as I did in school. The cataclysm happened when several different factions in the old world were unable to reach an accord and their leaders, stupidly, each thought they could win a global war. I see you have that here. And you mention nuclear and chemical weapons, and of course the effect of electromagnetic battles on their data storage devices is understood. But does the history really support the idea that women didn't have skeins much before the cataclysm? I know, I know about the occasional statues we find of women without skeins from before the cataclysm, but that could just be artistic license. Surely it makes more sense that it was women who provoked the war. I feel instinctively, and I hope you do too, that a world run by men would be more kind, more gentle, more loving and naturally nurturing. Have you thought about the evolutionary psychology of it? Men have evolved to be strong worker homestead keepers, while women, with babies to protect from harm, have had to become aggressive and violent. The few partial patriarchies that have ever existed in human society have been very peaceful places. I know you're going to tell me that soft tissue doesn't preserve well and we can't look for evidence of skeins and cadavers that are 5,000 years old. But shouldn't that give you pause too? Are there any problems that your interpretation solves that the standard model of world history leaves unsolved? I mean, it's a clever idea, I'll grant you. And maybe worth doing for that reason alone, just as a fun exercise. But I don't know if it advances your cause to make an assertion that can't be backed up or proved. You might tell me that it's not the job of a work of history or fiction to advance a cause. Now I'm having an argument with myself. I'll wait for your reply. I just want to challenge your thinking here before the critics do. Much love, Naomi. Dearest Naomi, thank you, first of all, for taking the time and trouble to read the manuscript. I was afraid it was practically incoherent. I'm afraid I've lost all sense of it. I have to say, I uh, don't think much of evolutionary psychology, at least as it relates to gender. As to whether men are naturally more peaceful and nurturing than women, mm, that'll be up to the reader to decide, I suppose. But consider this. 
Are patriarchies peaceful because men are peaceful? Or do more peaceful societies tend to allow men to rise to the top because they place less value on the capacity for violence? Just asking the question. Now, let's see. What else did you ask? Oh, the male warriors. I mean... I can send you images of hundreds of partial or full statues of male soldiers. They've been unearthed around the world. And we know how many movements have been devoted to completely obliterating all traces of the time before. I mean, just the ones we know about number in the thousands. We find so many smashed statues and carvings, so many obliterated marking stones. If they hadn't been destroyed, imagine how many male soldiers' statues there'd be. We can interpret them however we like, but it's actually pretty clear that around 5,000 years ago, there are a lot of male warriors. People don't believe it because it doesn't fit with what they already think. As to whether you find it believable that men could be soldiers, or what your sexual fantasies are about battalions of uniformed men, well, I can't be held responsible for that, Anne. I mean, I take your point, some people will just treat it as cheap porn. And that's always the tawdry inevitability if you write a rape scene. But surely serious people will see through that. Ah, yes, OK, you ask, does the history really support the idea women didn't have skeins much before the cataclysm? The answer is yes, it does. At least you have to ignore a huge raft of archaeological evidence to believe otherwise. This is what I've tried to communicate in my previous history books, but, as you know, I don't think anyone wanted to hear it. I know you probably didn't mean it to come across as patronising, but it's not just a fun idea to me. The way we think about our past informs what we think is possible today. If we keep on repeating the same old lines about the past when there's clear evidence that not all civilizations had the same ideas as us, we're denying that anything can change. Oh, God, I don't know. Now I've written that, I feel more uncertain than I did before. Were there particular things that you've read elsewhere that made you feel uncertain about this book? I might be able to work them in somewhere. Much love, and thanks again for reading it. I really do appreciate it. When yours is done, another masterpiece, I'm sure, I owe you a practical criticism essay on every chapter. Love, Neil. Dear Neil, yes, of course, I didn't mean fun in the sense of trivial or stupid. I hope you know I'd never think that about your work. I have a lot of respect for you. I always have had. But all right, as you've asked, there's an obvious question for me. What you've written here contradicts so many of the history books we all read as children, and they're based on traditional accounts going back hundreds, if not thousands of years. What is it that you think happened? Are you really suggesting that everyone lied on a monumental scale about the past? All love, Naomi. Dear Naomi, thanks for getting back so quickly. So, in answer to your question, I don't know if I have to be suggesting that everyone lied. I mean, for one thing, of course, we don't have original manuscripts dating back more than a thousand years. All the books we have from before the cataclysm have been recopied hundreds of times. That's a lot of occasions for errors to be introduced. And not just errors, all of the copyists would have had their own agendas. For more than 2,000 years, the only people recopying were nuns in convents. Now, I don't think it's at all a stretch to suggest that they picked works to copy that supported their viewpoint and just let the rest moulder into flakes of parchment. I mean, why would they recopy works that said that men used to be stronger and women weaker? Now, that would be heresy and they'd be damned for it. I mean, this is the trouble with history. You can't see what's not there. You can look at an empty space and see that something's missing, but there's no way to know what it was. I'm just drawing in the blank spaces. It's not an attack. Love, Neil. Dearest Neil, I don't think it's an attack. It's hard for me to see women portrayed as they are at times in this book. We've talked about this often. How much 
what it means to be a woman is bound up with strength and not feeling fear or pain. I've been grateful for our honest conversations. I know you've sometimes found it difficult to form relationships with women, and I understand why. I'm so grateful that we've preserved a friendship out of what we had, though. It was so important to me that you listened when I said things that I'd never have been able to tell Salim or the children. The scene of the skein removal was very hard to read. Love, Naomi. Dear Naomi, thank you for that. I know you're trying. You're one of the good ones. I really want this book to make something better, and I think we can be better than this. This thing isn't natural to us, you know? Some of the worst excesses against men were never, well, in my opinion anyway, perpetrated against women in the time before the cataclysm. Three or four thousand years ago, it was considered normal to cull nine in ten boy babies. Fuck, there, there are still places today where boy babies are routinely aborted or have their dicks curbed. This can't have happened to women in the time before the cataclysm. We talked about evolutionary psychology before. It would have made no evolutionary sense for cultures to abort female babies on a large scale or, or to fuck about with their reproductive organs. So it's not natural to us to live like this. It can't be. I can't believe it is. We can choose differently. The world is the way it is now because of 5,000 years of ingrained structures of power based on darker times when things were much more violent and the only important thing was, could you and your kin jolt harder? But we don't have to act that way now. We can think and imagine ourselves differently once we understand what we've based our ideas on. Gender is a shell game. What is a man? Whatever a woman isn't. What is a woman? Whatever a man is not. Tap on it and it's hollow. Look under the shells. It's not there. Kisses, Neil. Dearest Neil, have been pondering this all weekend. There's a lot to think about and discuss, and I think it's best if we meet to talk it over. I worry that I might write something that you'll interpret in the wrong way, and I don't want that. I know it's a sensitive topic for you. I'll ask my assistant if he'll sort out some dates for us to have lunch. This is not to say that I'm not behind the book. I really am. I want to make sure it reaches the widest possible audience. Best love, Naomi. P.S. I have one suggestion. You've explained to me how anything you do is framed by your gender, that the frame is as inescapable as it is nonsensical. Every book you write is assessed as part of men's literature. So what I'm suggesting is just a response to that, really, nothing more. There's a long tradition of men who found a way out of that particular bind. You'd be in good company. Neil, I know this might be very distasteful to you, but have you considered publishing this book under a woman's name? This has been a Hachette audio production of The Power, written by Naomi Alderman, read by Adjua Ando. The Power is also available in print and digital formats from Little Brown & Company, a division of Hachette Book Group. For more Hachette Audio productions, visit us at hachetteaudio.com. Thank you for listening. Text copyright 2016 by Naomi Alderman. Montgomery Taylor. Audio production copyright 2017 by Audible Limited. All rights reserved. Hachette Book Group supports the right to free expression and the value of copyright. The purpose of copyright is to encourage writers and artists to produce the creative works that enrich our culture. The duplicating, uploading, and distribution of this audiobook without permission is a theft of the author's intellectual property. If you would like permission to use material from the audiobook, other than for review purposes, please contact permissions at hbgusa.com. Thank you for your support of the author's rights. This audiobook is a work of fiction. Names, characters, places, and incidents are either the product of the author's imagination or are used fictitiously. 
and any resemblance to actual persons, living or dead, events or locales, is entirely coincidental. Audible.